Yeah, copy that shit. Um, we're in the Brad Theater and the air conditioning is just not on. Yeah, <laughs> it's very hot. <laughs> Thank you. I know. <laughs> in the Bragg Theatre and the air conditioning is really hot. We've got a function. Yeah, the new 
Shadow Bay. I think some other items are coming. Oh, I'm gonna. Well, one of us is going to. He's going to have to stand here with a mic then. We need to have a mic too. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes, it is. Well, I'm going to talk about the price of inequality. Uh, I grew up in uh, Gary, Indiana, uh, which is uh, a steel town, and was a steel town, uh, on the southern shore of uh, Lake Michigan. And the history of Gary really reflects uh, the history of industrialization in the United States. It was founded in 1906. Uh, it was named after Judge Gary, who was the chairman of the board of U.S. Steel. It was the largest integrated steel mill. Uh, in the world, uh, it grew uh, during the mid 19th, uh, 20th century and then went into decline. As I was growing up, I saw so vividly uh, problems of inequality, poverty, discrimination. I saw workers fighting to get a decent wage, a decent income to live on. 
after uh, I left Gary, uh, things got worse. Uh, I went back a couple years ago to do a, a film, uh, and what I saw really reflected uh, how much worse things were, have gotten since what, uh, the period where I, I was growing up. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, the way things have evolved in the United States in the last, especially 30 years. Uh, these concerns about inequality, about poverty, about discrimination, were among the reasons that, uh, the things that motivated me to, to uh, study economics. Uh, but the consequences of this inequality uh, now affect not just our economics, not just a moral issue, uh, it affects our politics, it affects our society. What I've written in my book, The Price of Inequality, is that we are paying in all these dimensions, in the dimension of politics, society, economy, a very high price for this inequality. So let me describe uh, first a little bit about the way things have changed, uh, how inequality has been growing. Now first let me emphasize that there's no single way of measuring inequality, no single uh, feature. And what's so striking about the United States is that every aspect has gotten worse. Uh, the fraction of the income that goes to the very top, uh, the top 1% get around 20, 25% of the total national income. The top one-tenth of 1% get an even more, more disproportionate share of the national income pie. And things have gotten much worse, as I said. The share that goes to the top 1% has doubled since 1980. The share that goes to the top one-tenth of 1% has tripled. We can also talk about the howling out of the middle, the fact that those in the middle are not doing very well. And we could also talk about the increase of poverty, the larger numbers of people of poverty, the miseration of those uh, at the bottom of the income distribution. So all of these are, are ways in which things have been uh, in many ways getting worse in the United States in, in the last, uh, especially 30 years. But since the onset of the Great Recession in 2008, things have gotten much, much worse. To give you a, a little picture uh, of what's happening, some data that just came out uh, very recently shows that in the last two years, more than 100% of all the gain in the United States has gone to the top 1%. And that means while the 1% is doing very well, the rest of us are actually doing worse. Most Americans' major asset is their home. And the result uh, of the crash of the housing prices is that the median wealth in the United States, well, half of the people are above, half are below, has fallen to the level that it was in the early 1990s. What does that mean? That means that all the gain in the wealth in the United States over the last two decades has essentially gone to the top of our income distribution. Well, there are a number of, of myths uh, that have been uh, that have uh, persisted uh, about this inequality. Some people have said, for instance, that uh, inequality is just, to even discuss it is the politics of envy, that you should only talk about it in quiet rooms, uh, in hushed voices. And one of the presidential candidates actually said that. Uh, I disagree. I think it's fundamental to an understanding of what is going on in our politics, in our economy, in our society today. So one of the important uh, myths is that everybody benefits. Uh, this is an old idea called trickle-down economics. I wish it were true because we've thrown so much money at the top 
If it were true, we would all be doing very well. But in fact, while the top has been doing very well, those in the middle, the median, has not. Median income today in the United States is lower than it was a decade and a half ago. Median income of a full-time male worker, and that's a large part of our population, uh, the median income of a full-time male worker is lower than it was in 1968, 45 years ago. So if you understand why, if you, want, if you want to understand why there's a kind of frustration in the United States, it really reflects a reality of this kind of stagnation. Another myth that's been very, very uh, pervasive is the notion that those at the, th those at the top deserve uh, their higher income. They contributed more. They made it on their own. And a lot of people who, who become very wealthy like to convince themselves that they did it on their own. But nobody makes it on their own. Everybody has helped along the way in one way or another. We all depend on, on a functioning society. There are people in, in poor countries that I've seen over and over again who work extraordinarily hard. And in spite of working so hard, the level of income that they have is very moderate. Uh, many of them are very poor. If you look at the people at the top, it's not the people who really transformed our society, who really transformed our knowledge. It's not the people who, who invented DNA, who discovered DNA, who invented the laser or the transistor. It's disproportionately a group of people that I refer to as rank seekers. People who've been very good of seizing a larger share of the pie rather than making the pie bigger. People like monopolists, pe people in the financial sector who, who really perfected skills of predatory lending, abusive credit card practices. Um, so a whole variety of ways in which uh, people can grab a bigger share of the pie. We're used to thinking of people in oil-rich countries as rank-seeking. And unbeknownst or unwittingly, we have become, to a large extent, a country in which those who are rewarded the most are rank-seekers. A third important myth concerns opportunity. We would like to believe America is a land of opportunity. That's the notion of the American dream, and it's very much uh, in part of our psyche. We, stories of Horatio Elger, people who did make it uh, by dint of their own hard work from the bottom to the middle, the bottom to the top, uh, really a part of American uh, 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 psyche. But if you look at the numbers, they don't support this view. If you look at the numbers, yes, some people do make it from the bottom to the middle or the bottom to the top. But what matters is, what is the chance? And President Obama in his inaugural address talked about the fact that somebody born to a poor family should have an equal chance of making it to the top. It's not true today. But what's even more striking is not only is the United States the ad country, the advanced industrial country with the most inequality of any of the other countries, but it's also the country with among the worst equality of opportunity. And that means the chances of somebody going from the bottom to the middle, the bottom to the top, are lower in the United States than even in old Europe. It means that the life prospects of a young person in the United States is more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries for which there's data. And this, of course, goes very much against our own uh, self-image. The fact that there are such different outcomes, really in different countries, itself destroys another myth. That myth is that uh, this is inevitable. This is just market um, forces. Just learn to live with it. <laughs>
But the same market forces are operating, are, are operating on both sides of the Atlantic, both sides of the Pacific. Those are global forces. Okay, everyone. And why is it with the same global forces, the same... Welcome, everyone. We'll uh, just get underway. If people are waiting outside, if they could just come in, please. That would be great. My name is John Spear. I'm Executive Director of the Australian Workplace Innovation and Social Research Centre and on the Board of Management of the Don Dunstan Foundation and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today to this very, very important event. Um, and uh, the event is sponsored by the Don Dunstan Foundation uh, with support from the Public Service uh, Association of South Australia. Uh, it's, an, it's an event that um, has been the product of really 18 months of thinking and work by some of the speakers who are with us today. I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting uh, on the lands of the Kaurna people, the traditional owners of this land, and we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land, and, acknowledging, uh, and acknowledge they are that it is of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today, and we respect their elders past and present. Today's event, attended by over 300 people and is also being live streamed, so for those of you who want to visit again or encourage your friends and colleagues to view today's proceedings, you can go to the Don Dunstan Foundation site and you'll be able to uh, view the, the live stream as often as you like. I'd strongly encourage you to, to uh, uh, let your colleagues and friends know that uh, this event will be available on the Don Dunstan Foundation site. I want to thank at the outset um, the organiser of today's, organisers of today's event, um, the Don Dunstan Foundation, my colleagues in the Australian Workplace Innovation and Social Research Centre, Ben Waters, Mark Dean, Josie Covino, Donna Harden and the wider teams in the Don Dunstan Foundation and the Australian Workplace Innovation and Social Research Centre. Thanks very much for all your good work in, in, in uh, pulling uh, today together and making it such a success. I think it's testimony to uh, the concerns about austerity here in Australia that we've got such a large group of people here today. I hope you find uh, today really informative. Uh, it's designed to provide us with, with some insights into the lessons of the European and US experience with various different austerity packages and policies, many of which you would be well aware of having followed the news and the papers since the global financial crisis uh, back in 19. Uh, at the, back in 2007 uh, eight. Australia is a bit of an exception, really, uh, and we should be very proud that it is. Uh, Australia acted very early in response to the global financial crisis, introducing uh, one of the largest stimulus packages very early on uh, in response to the major downturn in Europe and the United States. And that has helped uh, to insulate Australia from some of the worst effects of the global financial crisis, something that the uh, International, Monetary Fund, uh, International Monetary Fund now acknowledges. We'll hear more about that in a little while. But with us today, we've got um, some terrifically um, uh, talented and important figures in the austerity debate internationally. Uh, Jamie Peck, Dexter Whitfield and John Quiggan. Some, um, We'll know them and their work, and I encourage you after today to, to have a look at the wider work that they've undertaken. Uh, I'd alert you to uh, three important pieces of work that uh, have been undertaken for the Don Dunstan Foundation and the Australian Workplace uh, Innovation and Social Research Centre by Dexter Whitfield, three papers that Dexter will refer to, which are available today uh, on the Don Dunstan website and the Australian Workplace Innovation and Social Research Centre. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first of our speakers, and I should say at the outset we'll have um, two speakers in succession, then we'll have a short break at uh, 10.45 before John Quiggan will speak, and then we'll have time for uh, a panel discussion and questions 
from, from the audience. Our first speaker uh, is Jamie Peck. Um, Jamie is a Canada Research Chair in Urban and Regional Political Economy and Professor uh, of UBC. He's a recipient of the Guggenheim and Harkness Fellowships and he was previously Professor of Geography and Sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Professor of uh, Geography at the uh, University of Manchester. And he's held various visiting positions at the John Hopkins, uh, the National University of Singapore, uh, the University of Melbourne, the Uni University of Amsterdam and Queen's Belfast. Can you please join me in welcoming Jamie Peck. Thank uh, you for that uh, kind introduction and um, I'm very glad to be uh, here at the beginning of um, uh, what seems to be, uh, what seems likely to be a very important uh, part of the debate in Australia about the uh, role of austerity and um, the quite wide and deep now international experience of uh, austerity politics. Um, I'm going to focus in my uh, remarks this morning on uh, the politics of austerity, especially in the United States, um, and we'll, I suppose the logic of uh, the sequence of the speakers is we'll track uh, closer towards uh, more familiar territory. Uh, but I'm also going to start off in, in looking at the situation in the US uh, with some of the more extreme effects of austerity, uh, and some of the experiences which might seem uh, rather foreign and distant uh, to your experience. Uh, but I think which also reveal uh, some of the uh, recurring uh, features of austerity politics and some of the familiar routines that are used uh, in the advocacy of these uh, positions. So what I'll do today is cover uh, four uh, themes. First, say something about what uh, austerity means as a uh, strategy. Um, then go into the particular shape that austerity measures have taken in the United States. Um, I don't think there's entirely a standard package experience of austerity, so uh, we do need to be attentive of country by country uh, circumstances. And the US experience is both uh, extreme and a rather extreme form of devolved uh, financial discipline. I'll then uh, mention briefly some of the work that I've been doing uh, on the Detroit uh, bankruptcy. Uh, in many ways, Detroit's uh, bankruptcy signifies the epicenter of the, uh, of, of the U.S. austerity problem at the, at the present time and is uh, the focus of a lot of public discussion. And I'll end with some comments uh, on, the, on politics in an age of austerity, uh, which I think present uh, particular challenges uh, for uh, the opponents of austerity measures. So first of all, um, one of the things to say about this word austerity is it's uh, in many ways a key word of the post-GFC uh, period. Uh, this graph gives you an indication of the uses of this term uh, in major international newspapers uh, since uh, 2005. Uh, you'll see we've already passed the peak of uh, austerity talk uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, it's interesting that it's actually intensifying here. Um, in fact, the uh, American dictionary company uh, Merriam-Webster uh, identified austerity as their word of the year in uh, 2010 uh, because it was the most searched for term on, in their online uh, dictionary. And uh, it came just ahead of moratorium, pragmatism, socialism, and bigot uh, in, uh, in the, that year's annual searches. And it's remained uh, fairly high in, as a search term in American uh, in those American dictionaries, I think because austerity in the United States is seen as something that primarily afflicts Europe. Uh, austerity is generally not a key word used by American politicians. It's seen as an affliction of European bloated welfare states and so on in the pejorative ways in which they're talked about in mainstream American uh, political discourse. Uh, but I want to suggest that even if austerity is not necessarily the word that's been used in the States, its practices uh, are very deeply entrenched and in many ways uh, naturalized in the, uh, the American uh, 
um, uh, political economy. Uh, before moving on to the US case, I'll uh, briefly show you this image of uh, David Cameron, um, who recommitted the UK governments um, uh, to, to austerity measures uh, here in the rather ill-fitting uh, surroundings of the Lord Mayor of London's uh, banquet. Uh, Cameron stated at this uh, opulent event, uh, we are sticking to the task, but that doesn't mean making difficult decisions on pub public spending. It doesn't only mean that. It also means something more profound. It means building a leaner, more efficient state. We need to do more with less, not just now, uh, but permanently. I think this illustrates the point that there will be a theme of my talk that um, austerity is something that you do to others. It's something uh, that's generally imposed on the socially weak, uh, the politically undefended and so on. It's a strategy that is imposed downwards in social uh, terms. Um, economically, austerity measures, I would argue, are also effectively like applying leeches to an anemic patient. Um, they tend only to delay uh, economic recovery, they starve the economy of critical investment during key periods, and there's in fact very little international uh, experience that austerity measures are logical and effective from an economic policy point of view. One of the reasons that they're widely used, however, I would say, is for reasons of political opportunism. They provide a, an opportunity to act, to drive through tough reforms, uh, to uh, engender arguments about imperative uh, restructuring of government services and social services in particular. So the politics of austerity, um, I think, warrant particular attention, especially given that the role as economic policies uh, remains uh, severely questionable. One uh, American commentator who has drawn attention to the role of austerity in the U.S. is uh, the veteran uh, um, political writer Tom Edsel, whose recent book, The Age of Austerity, put it like this. Uh, we've entered a period of austerity markedly different from anything we've seen before. A brutish future stands before us. The politics of scarcity favor the right, which is better equipped ideologically than the left to inflict the hardship measures a sustained economic crisis invites. Nonetheless, Republicans in power have frequently overestimated their mandate at forfeiting public support. And if you're following the news today, you'll see um, the debate around Senate votes and so on suggests that the Republicans are now trying to rein in some of their um, austerity talk and invocation of debt crises and so on in, in anticipation of recapturing the U.S. Senate uh, in the fall elections. And so there's, it's been rather difficult for the Republicans to find the right line on austerity, but certainly they've taken advantage of these broad conditions to push the case uh, for severe uh, social spending. Uh, restrictions. So what does austerity mean uh, in political terms? Uh, in my reading of the situation, what it means essentially is a, f a form of redistributive politics, a form of regressive uh, redistribution, where the pain and the costs of adjustment are pushed downwards, um, uh, down the social structure and often also down spatially to local uh, and state uh, governments. So what austerity politics means is a reallocation of the blame uh, for the causes of economic uh, crisis and a reallocation of the burdens of adjustment uh, generally in a downward direction. And it's the language of austerity which has uh, enabled um, uh, political elites in the United States and elsewhere to translate what began as a banking crisis in 2008 into effectively a social state crisis today. Little did we know in 2008 that the underlying causes of economic weakness in the U.S. economy were the pensions paid to elementary school teachers in Wisconsin. Uh, that highly improbable story has actually become a mainstream account. Uh, and now the mainstream understanding is that the state must be, must be kind of starved of investment and we must shrink uh, uh, its spending on social measures and so on as the only way to recover uh, from the, the Great Recession that followed the Wall Street crash. Uh, Mark Blythe, in his brilliant book on austerity, has described this political uh, uh, feat 
of translating a banking crisis into a state crisis as the greatest bait and switch in human history. Um, and certainly, I think it is quite a significant achievement, but if we look at how it's been achieved, I think it's been achieved by various forms of push politics. We've seen strong arguments pushed that the underlying causes of economic problems are the level of debt, the size of the state, and so on. And this has provided an opportunity to push back against the public sector, uh, to, to push back against the pension system in particular. So this means that in the crosshairs of this austerity narrative uh, in the United States have been public sector unions uh, in particular, uh, pension schemes in municipal state and state governments uh, in particular, and there's also triggered a new wave of privatization measures and public uh, asset sales. And what this pushes towards is to a, towards a yet leaner form of local government in the United States and anticipates what I believe will be a series of small state crises uh, it's not pushing towards some new equilibrium political settlement, uh, but in fact engendering a series of crises of which the Detroit bankruptcy is perhaps one of the more extreme manifestations, but a manifestation nonetheless. What does austerity mean Auster or institutionally uh, in this US model? Uh, essentially what it establishes is budgetary constraint as an operating matrix for political action. It means that cases made for new forms of public spending and investment are extremely difficult to push through. Uh, and in fact, most politics operates in a context of constraint and in a climate of cutbacks. In the US case, uh, the particular form that this takes is what's known as fiscal federalism. This is a legal doctrine uh, brought to us by the uh, Chicago School of Law and Economics uh, which, which argues that essentially local units of government and states are all responsible for their own uh, welfare. So each unit of government has to internalize the costs or benefits of its own activities. This notion of fiscal federalism is the antithesis of redistributive spending. It's the antithesis of Keynesian investment logics and anti-cyclical spending. It suggests that when you experience the pain of adjustment, this should be localized and concentrated on the uh, governmental units that are in the most difficulty. And it, it's operated in the US over the last 30 years or so to take the form of a series of tax and spending uh, restrictions, which means that many local governments in particular are, are legally constrained from raising taxes uh, or increasing uh, spending. Uh, most cannot uh, operate deficit budgets, for example, and so there are extreme uh, limitations placed on especially uh, local government expenditures under this general uh, climate. And what it means is that fiscal discipline trickles down very quickly from the top to the bottom in the United States. The benefits of growth uh, famously rarely did trickle down, uh, but the pain of economic adjustment certainly does. And so fiscal discipline is projected down to the state and local government uh, levels. So this means then that what, uh, what um, austerity anticipates is a shift away from redistributive transfers and anti-cyclical spending uh, towards the debt-based financing of municipal governments and pro-cyclical uh, forms of spending. So government spending is cut at exactly the same time as the private economy starts to shrink. And the landscape that this creates, a landscape of austerity in the United States, is one that is marked with bankrupt cities like Detroit and, and several uh, dozen other uh, municipalities that have entered a similar kind of state, and fiscally gated suburbs uh, which are essentially opting out of the costs of maintaining city services uh, by essentially balkanizing their uh, financial arrangements. So if that's a, a broad uh, context here, let me now say something about the particular shape uh, that these measures have taken in the United States. Uh, this chart gives you an indication of the measures that the 50 US states have taken in an attempt to close budget gaps, uh, severe budget gaps in the period since the uh, Wall Street crash of 2008. Uh, practically every state in the, in the nation has under, undertaken various forms of cuts, most of them across the board, some uh, 
um, uh, targeted. Nearly all the states have emptied their rainy day funds. Um, most states have also engaged in various forms of uh, workforce rationalization. They've laid off public sector workers, furloughed uh, those workers, reduced salaries, uh, reduced pension uh, rights, and so on. There's also been significant restructuring of the state and local government system, a reorganization and abol abolition of agencies, uh, severe re reductions in aid to localities, so these are transfers from the state down to the city and local government level. Most of those have been cut. And a number of um, user fees and sin taxes have been introduced uh, to try to raise revenues, at least at the margin, in the context of uh, uh, these extremely stringent uh, conditions. So first of all, let me say something about this, these uh, cuts and, uh, and what this means. Uh, especially for municipalities in the United States. I've suggested that austerity pressures tend to trickle down in the American uh, model. Uh, the huge charitable trusts in their investigations of um, municipal spending have described the effect as a one-two punch of falling revenues and increased uh, social need. Um, this has been exacerbated by historical reductions in fiscal transfers from higher levels of government, uh, which have been gradually wound back over the last 30 years or so, but especially intensively um, since the GFC. And in the, uh, the outcome of that, many cities find themselves caught between a low and relatively flat uh, tax base and mandates often legal in form against uh, deficit spending of any kind. So the Government Accountability Office in Washington, D.C. Uh, estimates that property tax revenues, which are the primary source of income for local government in the U.S., won't return to their 2009 levels until 2039. So this, this is not simply a cyclical uh, stress on the system. This is long-term uh, pressure. And it's now widely recognized that the state and local government system in the United States is facing a fiscal gap of a structural uh, and entrenched nature. In fact, the GAO says that with no policy changes, it'll, this will ne necessitate expenditure reductions of 12.7% per annum every year till 2062. Um, so these are really long-term uh, pressures and I think dysfunctions of a, uh, a highly um, uh, fiscally straightened system uh, where pressures are immediately dumped on the scales of government that are least able to cope uh, with those pressures. And what it does in effect is to lock in various forms of lean uh, local government uh, by dint of fiscal ne necessity rather than political choice. Uh, and so I think that form of uh, forced restructuring is very much the pattern uh, in American local government at the moment. So uh, one manifestation of this is the, uh, the growth of uh, municipal bankruptcies, which have been, um, these are relatively rare uh, financial events because the bankruptcy code is not a particularly useful one for municipalities, although they have been able to use it since the 1930s. Um, you can't liquidate a city, so there's not, uh, entering bankruptcy uh, really only means more pain for all, all involved. Uh, so this doesn't really solve cities' problems, but it's a measure of well, them really running out of options altogether uh, when a bankruptcy uh, is declared. Uh, this gives you the pattern of recent municipal bankruptcies in the United States. Uh, the most infamous ones of the modern period were Orange County's bankruptcy in 1994 until the latest burst of bankruptcies uh, culminating in Detroit as the largest ever um, on record. Um, what I would say here is that the pattern of cyclicality is one that we should note. It, it suggests that municipal spending and municipal authorities are increasingly exposed to cyclical pressures when there's essentially a recurrent purging of, of their uh, budgets. And so state and local revenues have dropped increasingly sharply during recessionary periods. So in the last recession, state and local revenues fell by 13%. Uh, that's three times more than they fell in the previous recession of 2001. And it's six times more than they fell in the Reagan recessions of the early 1980s. So cyclical uh, discipline is intensifying on the system and it's pushing more cities uh, to the brink of bankruptcy. <clears throat> 
Now, as I mentioned, uh, Detroit is, uh, Detroit's declaration of bankruptcy last year is, uh, in many respects, um, the most infamous of these cases and the most uh, discussed. Um, this gentleman is Kevin Orr, the emergency manager of the city of Detroit, uh, pictured uh, with the Republican governor of uh, Michigan, Rick Snyder, on one side, and uh, the uh, mayor of Detroit, who effectively was stood down when the emergency manager was appointed uh, in the city. The emergency manager takes over most of the powers of elected officials, uh, including um, the right to uh, hire and fire staff, to close departments and restructure them, uh, to privatize and to make all major decisions. Uh, most of the Detroit councillors, including the mayor himself, decided not to run again in the following election, um, making the reasonable calculation that they were able to exercise almost no power in what effectively is a fiscal coup. Uh, so the imposition of emergency managers, which is a part of Michigan law, is part of this new um, landscape of extreme fiscal measures becoming uh, effectively the dominant uh, story. So Kevin Orr uh, promises to impose the rule of reason uh, on Detroit and says that I'm not a political animal, I'm a restructuring professional, he's actually a well-established bankruptcy lawyer and I'm going to function uh, in that uh, capacity. Now, the debate about um, how Detroit should handle its bankruptcy uh, has largely followed this logic of fiscal federalism uh, that essentially says that Detroit has to, uh, the, these were problems created by Detroit and they must be solved locally by Detroit. And the uh, local uh, free market uh, think tank, the Mackinac Center, um, gives you the most uncut version of this uh, conservative austerity logic. Uh, the Mackinac Center says that de let Detroit save itself by fundamentally reforming the city's government and business climate. Let Detroit save itself and better serve its residents through a comprehensive program of privatizing city services. Let Detroit save itself by repealing the city's income tax, downsizing the city's bureaucracy and rolling back the regulatory burden on city businesses. So this conventional package of neoliberal, uh, neoconservative restructuring uh, uh, moves has, has become the kind of dominant narrative in, in, in places like Detroit for the drive the restructuring process, and which you see in the newspapers and so on echoed um, all over the place. So this isn't just a fringe preoccupation of conservative think tanks. Uh, it increasingly shapes, I think, the dominant uh, narrative on Detroit solving its own problems in effect. Now the Mackinac Center is one of the network of conservative think tanks with close links to the Heritage Foundation in Washington DC, uh, the Manhattan Institute in New York City which has got a particular remit to focus on urban policy set up in 1979. Uh, Manhattan has just established a West Coast branch in California uh, where it's focused strategically on the California pensions crisis and an attempt essentially to stoke the debate about uh, the pension system in California being unaffordable and needing to be privatized and so forth. Um, the Mackinac Center is also linked to a network of uh, state level think tanks called the uh, State Policy Network which has been running since 1992 and a now infamous organization funded by the Koch brothers um, and the American Legislative Exchange Council which produces uh, template measures for local governments that really to take advantage of these conditions of austerity to drive through um, especially uh, pension rollbacks public sector employment cuts uh, and new privatization measures. So there's a, a whole apparatus now that's been created uh, around this effort. Uh, and these are the local level think tanks that are allied, for example, to the uh, state policy network. This is now quite an elaborate uh, apparatus. Most of these organizations aren't doing much thinking. I'll, uh, I'll readily accept that. They call themselves think tanks, but in fact most are repeating stations for um, a, a pretty conventional package of conservative measures uh, that are refined by the Heritage Foundation and Manhattan Institute and repeated at the local level and placed in local newspapers and so on and shape the discourse on, on the management of austerity. 
just to go back to the broader picture here, these are the cities and municipal uh, entities that are, have been placed under financial emergency in the state of Michigan. A new set of uh, laws introduced by the Republican governor that took over in 2010 um, allows the state to essentially take over local governments to impose an emergency manager to stand down the council and mayor and to take uh, extreme measures uh, in the restructuring of local government uh, entities. In the uh, state of Michigan, there are 10 million people live in Michigan. Uh, now one in 10 of them uh, live under an emergency manager. Uh, that, that means that one in 10 Michiganders uh, do not have an effective um, electoral democracy. Uh, they operate under a, a, a governor-imposed emergency manager. And this is a strongly uh, racialized uh, pattern uh, in Detroit. Such that uh, of the population in the state, 2.7% uh, of the white population live under an emergency manager, 51.7% uh, of the African American population uh, of Michigan live under emergency management. And uh, some quite sophisticated regression analyses that have been conducted on this data um, suggest that even if you control for fiscal conditions, race has an independent effect on whether a city is declared in financial emergency and uh, an emergency manager is imposed. This underlines the fact, you know, this is a social and political strategy as much as a straightforwardly political one. This, this provides opportunities to act, to take over what are in effect majority black cities like Detroit um, and to impose financial discipline in a kind of technocratic uh, form. So the logic of bankruptcy in this context, um, the logic of bankruptcy in this context is to, uh, or the realistic threat of bankruptcy, um, is to act, act as an accelerant of uh, restructuring. It intensifies pressures for restructuring. What bankruptcy does in places like Detroit is to concentrate and intensify the costs of adjustment. Um, it devolves risk both socially and spatially and suggests that the residents of Detroit must accommodate uh, the full cost of economic adjustment even though it clearly has much wider national and international um, uh, causes. These conditions also empower change managers. Uh, the emergency managers appointed by um, the governors are an extreme example of that. But in many cases, where you have fiscal restraint, uh, the arguments for dramatic change um, uh, tend to be, uh, there's a sort of wind at the back of uh, change managers, if you will. And it provides a pretext for new forms of dispossession via privatization. It residualizes troubled services and rotten assets and leaves more and more costly and difficult uh, assets and services on the public books at the end of, of sell-offs. Um, and the alternative to bankruptcy, um, which creates uh, screams of uh, opposition in, in the United States uh, these days, is the notion of a bailout. Any external aid to Detroit is pejoratively labeled as a bailout. Um, there's, in, these, in the context of this um, uh, fiscal federalism. So let me just say a little bit about um, uh, workforce rationalization now as one of the typical measures that states and localities have, have pursued in the context of this, uh, these uh, straightened uh, conditions. Uh, there's been a dramatic uh, attack on public sector uh, unions and employment in the period since the GFC uh, in the United States. This means that there are some local governments in the US where seven out of 10 of remaining public workers are either firefighters or police officers. Seven out of 10 of all people employed in a municipality are engaged in municipal services, uh, emergency services in some cases. So lean local government uh, is the outcome of these downward uh, fiscal pressures. Uh, this gives you the picture of um, local government employment in the last five recessions uh, in the US. And you can see how a broadly uh, Keynesian pattern, uh, the red lines where local government employment increases during a recessionary downturn in a compensatory uh, logic, has been displaced uh, by an austerity pattern in which local government 
uh, employment is severely cut during recessions and actually adds to uh, the uh, uh, labor market difficulties during these periods. Uh, the, the Obama line here continues to fall, making it the most severe cutback in local government employment in American history. Um, well over 600,000 uh, workers have been laid off in the local government sector in the US. And uh, it's continued to fall further and longer than the Reagan uh, cutbacks. So these are uh, severe, five minutes, okay, good. These are severe uh, cutbacks, in, in other words. Uh, there's also waves of restructuring that have been pursued um, as in the uh, context of these uh, fiscal pressures. Um, uh, a surprising number of cities have been forced to turn off their street lights uh, because they're unable to pay the electricity bill. Um, in the picture here, um, Highland Park, Michigan, um, has actually uh, done a deal with its privatized electricity company to tear out the street lamps from the ground uh, so the, street, the city will never be lit again except at major intersections. And the mayor's advice uh, is that citizens put on their porch lights uh, in replacement of the missing street lights. Uh, but the streetlights are not only being turned off in Michigan, uh, they've been turned off in Illinois, in Oregon, in Minnesota, in California, in Colorado, in Washington State. Um, so this gives you a sense of the lack of room for, for maneuver at the local level um, if you have to turn off the streetlights due to an inability to pay the bills. Uh, the uh, Michigan city of Pontiac, when an emergency manager took over there, um, uh, launched a uh, fire sale of practically all remaining public assets and put up for auction uh, its two community centers, its five fire stations, its 11 water pumping stations, 10 parking lots, the public library, the police station, and two cemeteries. Uh, at the public auction for those, uh, no bidders uh, arrived, uh, and the only person in the room was a local reporter. And these sort of dramatic sell-offs of any remaining public asset, uh, I think, illustrate the illogic of austerity when it reaches this extreme form. We also see new forms of imperative uh, privatization being driven through uh, the system, uh, the selling of naming rights on buses and school buses and fire hydrants, uh, the Texas prison system has uh, eliminated lunches for inmates at the weekends on budgetary, on budgetary grounds, and even the last meals for death row inmates uh, have been abolished due to budget cuts. Uh, Riverside California, County, California, uh, had to accommodate uh, 33,000 additional prisoners who were pushed out of the overcrowded state prison system had no capacity to accommodate them, and so responded by charging them $142 a night to stay in prison. Uh, you pay when you check out, apparently. Um, uh, but these absurd measures, I think, reflect you know, the logic of this system when it's uh, pushed to this, this extreme. On the alternative uh, side of this picture, we have places um, like um, uh, Sandy Springs, Georgia, just outside uh, Atlanta, home of uh, Herman Cain, the presidential, more comedic uh, presidential candidate of recent uh, past. Um, Sandy Springs is a place that operates what they call the model of total outsourcing and privatization of all public services. The town hall is in a rented suite in a shopping mall. Uh, they employ um, uh, even uh, 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 judges on temporary contracts in, in Sandy Springs. So these models of total privatization have been circulated through a libertarian and other circles. So let me end um, this uh, tour of some of the extreme sites of austerity by making a few comments on the politics of this in the United States. Um, in many respects, it seems to me, although I've made these sorts of predictions before, I'll confess, uh, that austerity, urbanism, really does feel like the end game of this uh, kind of US-style fi fiscal federalism of devolved uh, budgetary uh, discipline down to the local scale and the progressive incapacitation of local government. Um, we should 
Be aware, though, that austerity measures don't necessarily make their own grave diggers. Uh, they, there is not necessarily an automatic uh, politics of pushback against these, which is effective. In fact, uh, the politics of opposing austerity has proved to be uh, very difficult, even though there have been major mobilizations, such as this one in my former hometown of Madison, Wisconsin, where 100,000 people went onto the streets to oppose austerity measures and attacks on public sector unions. Um, the Wisconsin strategy was ultimately unsuccessful, but we've seen a whole series of protests against austerity which um, uh, have been unable to sustain a longer run political campaign. So what austerity tends to be associated with then is a localized politics of protest and resistance um, reflecting the kind of devolved suffering which is the logic of the system and de understandably defensive tactics on the part of uh, weakened um, actors like uh, labor unions and community organizations. Um, these are operating of course in the context of cumulatively incapacitated local government uh, systems. Uh, so the institutional basis of local government is being weakened, the basis of local government unionism is being undermined. Um, in many respects, the attack on the uh, public sector unions, to me, echoes the attacks on the blue-collar unions in the 1980s. In many respects, um, austerity feels like the deindustrialization moment of the 80s run through for the public sector in the United States. It's a major threat to public sector unionism in a context where 50% of remaining union members in the US are in the public sector. That is now the backbone of the American labor movement and it's under attack um, through these austerity measures. So the austerity politics then has this kind of, is enveloped uh, by a new and existentially constraining uh, rules of the fiscal game, which really restrict the capacity to respond at the local level just as they push down the pain to that level. So I think the question is, as we look around at the mayors in the various US cities at the present time and ask uh, what can they do, in many respects it's, it's a measure, it, the question is what powers do mayors have in this straightened context? We have a progressive mayor elected in New York City, Bill de Blasio, with a quite ambitious program, uh, but himself facing a $2 billion budget hole and uh, all manner of difficulties negotiating with his own public sector unions. Uh, the new mayor of Detroit, Mayor Duggan, on the other hand, is now trying to negotiate what's called a power sharing deal uh, with the emergency manager to try to claim back uh, some powers for elected officials in Detroit uh, for what is effectively uh, a form of technocratic uh, management. Um, so there are some um, interesting questions being raised about the latest rounds of elections in the uh, in US cities, but all of these mayors, I would argue, operate in the context of these really severe uh, fiscal constraints, which is essentially the story of austerity um, in the United States. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jamie, for that um, fabulously informative overview of what's happening in the United States. I wish I could say we, uh, that uh, we might cheer you up with the second speaker, but unfortunately the story <laughs> is uh, a rather gloomy one. And uh, we are very privileged to have with us here today Dexter Whitfield. Uh, he's director of the European Services Strategy Unit, and uh, we're proud to have him as an adjunct associate professor uh, at my centre here at the University of Adelaide. His, uh, he has a unique and extensive track, track record of research, policy analysis uh, and strategic advice to public bodies, industry, trade unions and community organisations. And Dexter will be talking about the, the British and the European experience. If you could pre please welcome Dexter Whitfield. Um, thank you very much, and uh, it's really great to be back in Adelaide. And unfortunately, it's the wrong su subject that we should be talking about, but nevertheless. But what I want to do is really um, talk about five 
structure my talk into five uh, elements. Firstly, um, why austerity has failed. Uh, secondly, to talk about the impact of austerity um, in uh, uh, of austerity policies, particularly in Europe and, and North America. Um, thirdly, to talk about the performance of the, the corporate sector, because it's all very well, well focusing on uh, what happens within the public sector. It's also vitally important that we look what, what has happened in the, in the corporate sector. And that, surprise, surprise, is a different picture altogether. But we'll come back to that. Um, fourth thing, to talk about the parallel transformation of public services and the welfare state. So these two things are interact, but they're also going in, 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 in parallel. And finally, to talk about some key lessons from uh, opposing austerity, where there has been really significant uh, action, uh, 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 particularly in, in Europe. Before I do that, I mean, I think it's important to uh, uh, establish the, uh, some comments that will make some comments about the, the cause of the, the financial crisis. The crisis was, in a sense, a, a failure within the private markets and, and, and in part caused by deregulation. It was not a sovereign state crisis. And I think it's really important that we uh, make that clear from, from the very beginning. In effect, in very short term, what, uh, uh, in a summarized way, what happened was a financialization um, and a private-led private um, 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 speculative boom um, resulted in the collapse of housing markets um, in the US, Spain, Ireland, and Iceland, and um, other factors plus, that, plus those events led to banking crises in 17 different countries uh, around the globe between 2007 and 2011. Um, governments initially responded to uh, the, the crisis with stimulus uh, strategies about increasing, particularly in, in increasing infrastructure investment. Um, but a lot of that, particularly in the States, was there wasn't uh, a, a it wasn't a big enough stimulus, so in a sense it started petering out. And then in 2010, the deficit hawks took control um, um, and, uh, you know, austerity became the central focus. And the G20 co uh, conference in uh, Toronto concluded with a policy of fiscal consolidation as the way forward. And so economic stimulus was put on the, on the back burner. Subsequently, bailouts were uh, required in Ireland, Iceland, Portugal, Spain, Greece, and Cyprus. Um, and a story, where historical terms and conditions were determined by the, uh, by the Troika, which is the IMF, the European Central Bank, and the European Union. So they determined what those, how those countries, uh, countries responded. Just very briefly, I think it's important in terms of what are austerity policies. As you've already heard, it is about, primary, uh, central focus is about cutting uh, expenditure. But in many European countries, it hasn't just been cutting public expenditure, it's been uh, about increasing revenue, and increasing revenue by increasing taxes, incre taxes have substantially increased in, in, in many countries. Um, increasing taxes on goods and services. Countries like Britain and, and, and Ireland, their first response was to put up um, the, 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 the tax on, on, on goods and services uh, by substantial amounts. Um, and it's also about increasing workers' contribution to, pe to pe their pension schemes and um, uh, as part of that uh, reform of, uh, of labour markets, which I'll come back to. Austerity also meant cuts in welfare. It made it much more the, 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 the uh, reform and rationalization of wel welfare schemes not only cut bent the relative value of benefits, it also made access to those benefits much more, more, more difficult. Many more barriers, legislation, and uh, 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 processes were put in way in order to deny benefits to people who needed it. And also privatization and outsourcing have been uh, major weapons, although it's really the focus in Europe has been on more on outsourcing and the level of privatization directly linked to austerity has been, uh, has been delayed and delayed, particularly in the, in, the, in the bailout countries. So moving on to why this austerity failed. 
This chart in, shows how government debt in the bailout countries in particular has not gone down, but has increased. And um, it increased in, uh, in Greece to something like 160% of, of GDP and to over, to 100, uh, to over 120 percent of GDP, both Spain, Portugal, and Ireland. That contrasts to the U.S., where government debt has increased to its highest level since 1945. And also, finally, I think it's important to put where does Australia fit in this? Australia has got the second lowest public debt um, of any OECD country, i.e., the, the 30 largest industrial nations in the world. Um, Australia is, is 34 percent. So there's not a debt crisis in Australia. The next graph is, tries to illustrate what has happened to uh, investment in non-financial corporations, in other words, ordinary business that are producing, producing goods and services in, in the economy. These figures are for the Eurozone and for U Europe as a, as a whole, and they show how that investment uh, in increased up to 2007 uh, and 8, and then plummeted uh, earthward um, by 2000, uh, between 2010 and 12, and it then recovered a bit, but has really hovered around at, at that, uh, that lower level. So that has had major uh, impact. The next graph illustrates, uh, and also what, what has happened to um, the fall in. Um, um, uh, bank lending to households and to non-financial corporations. The blue line indicates households, the red line indicates non-financial corporations. And again, the similar pattern is in terms of the previous diagram where they fell sharply in 2009, they recovered a bit in 2012, and then they fell again uh, in 2013. So in both indicators are in terms of investment and lending to the private sector and to households plummeted as a consequence of, of, and they have not, re not recovered despite those austerity policies. The next one shows what's happened to um, gross domestic, domestic product, output. What is the output of, uh, 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 has happened? Um, and this shows how uh, output plummeted uh, as a result of the financial crisis, both in Europe, USA, and Japan. It then recovered uh, in those countries, and uh, within the blue line in terms of what's happened in, uh, in Europe, it has gone back in, 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 into negative. So the level of output has not changed, in fact, has worsened under those policies of, of austerity. This graph is really interesting. It's a bit complicated in some respect, but what it shows, it shows two things really. This is about the UK only, but it shows, um, and, and the UK was not a bailout country, I have to say, um, um, but it shows two things. One, it shows um, the fall in output per hour um, was more severe than previous downturns in both 79 and 1990. Secondly, it shows the shaded area shows the loss of output and that how that output has not recovered and it shows what it, in, it also shows that we're in the, um, the, the, the in the sense of the depth of the recession and also it's the weakest recovery on record so despite again despite austerity measures output has not uh, uh, recovered as it did in the two uh, the green uh, lines going upwards where it shows recovery both in 79 and 1990. We're still in the depths of uh, uh, recession. Um, I think it's also indicative to, sh to just refer to uh, the uh, slowdown in, uh, in new enterprise formation, which has been very important. And in some countries, the creation of new enterprises has taken on a sort of uh, religious fervor. Uh, fervor. Um, but I think it's interesting uh, where there's been a big attempt in, uh, in Britain to establish new enterprises and new social enterprises uh, as well. But only one in 12 of those new enterprises um, in, in, uh, it, it, in, the, in recent years uh, is actually registered for VAT, um, for uh, uh, GSM, goods and sales uh, tax, GST, I mean, sorry. Um, so it's only one in 12, which proves the point 
that the vast majority of those enterprises are basically self-employed individuals. They're not employing anybody, they're employing themselves uh, because the, the, the barrier to register for uh, GST in Britain is, is relatively low. In terms of, the next one is, looks at it, um, public expenditure uh, in, in England and in Scotland. And just to focus on the, the, the red line and the orange line, which so show the decline in public exp expenditure and what has happened in, in terms of uh, local government in, in the, those two countries. And basically between 2009-2015, uh, um, um, uh, looking at the yellow line, which is a, adjusted, which takes certain functions out of local government because they have transferred to uh, 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 outside of the, the, the public sector in recent years. Taking that li line, the, the decline in, in England by 20, uh, 2015 will be 29%. The decline in Scotland will be 24%. So these are incredibly significant, deep cuts within the public sector. And basically, we've gone beyond the, 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 the strategy of efficiency gains, um, a bit of shared services here and there, and a bit more clever procurement. That is, it doesn't have any effect anymore because the scale of the cuts are, are so deep. And it's moving into you know, much more uh, uh, deeper consequences of um, uh, questions about whether authorities can actually s still continue to deliver statutory services and it's leading to further closures, really fundamental change uh, within, within local government. The, the government preserves, as they would call it, the NHS in terms of spending, but um, that has, in a sense, changed in recent years because they're now looking for 21.6% uh, savings across the NHS, and that's going to have other ramifications. So quickly, just to sum up, public debt has gone up, private investment has gone down, Bank lending to households and non-financial uh, uh, corporations has gone down. Output has gone down as well as a consequence of austerity policies. And I want to turn to looking at the impact of austerity. Um, and this graph or this illustration shows the consequences on, uh, uh, on in terms of mass unemployment uh, within several European countries. Um, the European youth employment um, within, uh, well, sorry, within, uh, it rose to over 60% in Greece, um, to over 50% in Spain, 40% in, in Italy. And these figures conceal the fact that there's been a high level of emigration, in particular from Ireland, but also from Spain and Portugal uh, uh, to uh, other, other countries. And that, so in a sense, these, the figures are, are concealed the, 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 the uh, em, em level of emigration. The, the next one highlights where that increased uh, unemployment is, is, is focused. And it's focused in the two taller uh, bar, uh, elements of that bar chart, in the 16 to 17 year olds and the 19 to 24, uh, 18 to 24 year olds, and this is a UK figure, but it shows that the unemployment is really focused in the, 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 the young people, that in a sense you, you might call them the lost generation, um, have borne the brunt of, of uh, ma mass unemployment uh, within Europe. In addition to this, there's also been uh, significant public sector job losses. This chart just shows that um, there's been a, a, a reduction in, in Ireland of 45,000 jobs, um, um, and 12% of public sector employment. On a broader level, by 2018, there's expected to be 1.1 1 .1 public, se public sector jobs lost in the UK, and two other figures, uh, 737,000 uh, uh, jobs were lost in the States uh, in the public sector up to 2013. Um, Spain lost 375,000 jobs. So we're not, these are really uh, uh, very significant uh, changes within, within the public sector. But it hasn't just been job loss, and this is a, a really important point, because those who did remain in the public sector have also suffered wage cuts um, and wage freezes on a substantial scale. 
an island um, the, the combined effect of pension uh, changes and wage cuts were up to 14 percent of, of salaries so it's not tinkering around the edges these are really substantial cuts and they have massive impact on local economies there's also been an increased employ, um, employment pay, pension uh, contributions um, the gender gap pay gap has actually increased it's widened rather than uh, uh, narrowed there's been cuts deliberate cuts in unemployment benefit and its duration in other words you might get the benefit but the length of time you got that has been shortened in, in many countries and there's a big attempt to reform the labor market um, supported by the OECD uh, uh, strategies and articulating uh, uh, reform measures in terms of reducing collective bargaining uh, and a whole series of other, other measures. And there's been across uh, uh, most European economies, there's been a, a massive increase in part-time temporary uh, work. Um, in Britain, there's been the emergence of, uh, of what we call zero-hour contracts, where the employer the employee is on call, but the employer has no obligation to provide work. So you've got a job, but you haven't got a job. And you may get paid, you may do work and get paid, but you may do no work at all. The next graph shows what's happened in Germany. And, and, and in Europe, within Europe, we've been pummeled, uh, 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 if that's the right word, um, by the righteousness of, of the German economic policies and um, what you know their position uh, uh, within Europe generally but this is some fundamental changes have been happening within the German economy as well which mirror what's been happening across uh, the rest of Europe the chart on the on the on the left shows how unemployment in Germany has actually come down from 7 million to I think 5.9 uh, million um, so there's, there's be, uh, sorry, uh, about 2.9 uh, uh, million. So there's been a decline in unemployment. But there's been a significant increase, if you look at the chart on the right, um, in what Germany calls mini jobs. And mini jobs are basically the right name for them, um, are jobs which um, are part time, temporary, um, uh, very low pay between. Uh, in terms of Australian dollars, uh, 5.50 an hour to uh, 11, uh, um, $11 an hour. They've got flexible hours. In other words, they're on call by, in many cases, by their employers. And they can earn up to $500 a month tax-free. Um, but they've got incredibly poor employment conditions. And there are something like 7.4 million, 20% of the German workforce are, have many jobs. And for two-thirds of that workforce, it is their only job. It's not as if you've got three or four mini jobs to, to, bring it, to get a, you know, a decent salary. So, and these jobs are predominant in the healthcare sector and retail sector. Moving quickly on, um, in terms of what's happened in terms of housing, this is just a graph that shows um, the, the degree of, of uh, foreclosures that happened in the, in, in the States. Um, there is now a negative equity in, in a number of countries um, in terms of mortgages, 31% in Ireland, 24% in Spain, 21.5% in the USA, and, uh, uh, and you know, the, uh, the level of foreclosures in the States uh, at one stage in uh, April 2009 reached 200,000 in that particular month. It says, the graph shows how that has declined, but um, there's still a significant uh, level of over 75,000 um, a month in June uh, 2013. So there's been massive rupture uh, within that uh, housing market. And in many countries, the issue of uh, mortgage debt and foreclosures hasn't really come to light as it did in, in the States uh, so early. This graph just uh, shows uh, what's happened to household debt. Everybody talks about the sovereign debt, and we talk about private debt in some way, but we, there's less discussion around what happens to household debt. And um, household debt, this is just the figures for, uh, uh, shows what happened in the UK, increased uh, prior to, uh, uh, to the financial crisis, then decreased 
but the, all the forecasts from the Office of Budget Responsibility in the Treasury uh, indicate that the household debt is going to in increase uh, uh, yet again. And that's got major implications in terms of the, uh, the housing market. There's also been significant uh, impacts on poverty and widening inequality. It's about re not just about reduced um, uh, access to uh, employment, uh, cuts in welfare state benefits and allowances, um, increased taxes uh, and charges for public services, um, and including cuts to, to personal budgets, closure of local facilities, um, particularly in housing, transport, libraries, arts and culture, uh, on a very significant uh, scale. And there's been decreased funding, in particular for going from the government to NGOs uh, and community organisations who have previously provi you know, provided services. Um, linked to all of this, there's been changes, particularly in Britain, a weakening of equality laws and legislation, making it much more difficult uh, to uh, 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 you know, uh, achieve uh, changes in, 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 or narrow that equality gaps. There's also been, obviously, damage to health um, as a consequence of all, all, all these policies. There have also been political consequences. I just want to make reference to, uh, without going into any detail, but in, in countries like Greece and one or two others, there's been a, a rise of uh, right-wing organizations um, uh, and a very significant uh, violent right-wing organizations, uh, I have to say, uh, in Greece, uh, in other countries, there's been no political change. In Ireland, there's been no real political uh, change with, between uh, 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 the, the structure or the power of the, of the or traditional parties or the emergence of, of new, new parties. And what has also been really uh, important in politically has been the, the mantra that we're all in this together. And this has been pushed systematically across Europe um, but, but particularly in Britain, that this, this idea that you we all, we're all sharing in this pain, when in reality, the pain, um, is, as Jamie emphasized, the pain is directed and driven downwards to the pe people least able to, to take the consequences and bear the effects of, of that pain. So, let's turn to the private corporate sector. This is just some few figures from um, the, um, what's happened to corporate profits. If we focus on just on, on, the, on the, the right hand side of the chart, um, that since 2007 uh, corporate profits have risen, uh, declined as a, as a consequence of the financial crisis, but um, uh, increase to 12.4% uh, in 2012, the highest since 1943. So clearly there are some people not suffering. The next chart shows cash hoarding by non-financial corporations. And we're not talking about financial institutions holding money, we're talking about non-financial institutions, i.e. businesses producing goods and services. And their cash hoarding has risen substantially, 81% increase to $1.6 trillion um, in 2013. Um, and there was no indication in that graph, in that, in that illustration, in terms of any negative effect of the financial con consequences. Uh, a couple of other uh, issues around uh, what's happened in, in, with corporate t tax rates. Despite the financial crisis and the need for, in a sense, increased income, corporate, in uh, corporate tax rates have began a downward uh, 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 movement and, if, uh, as you can see from that, have declined substantially from near 35% down to uh, just over t uh, 24% uh, within, the, that's within o o OECD countries. And the effective tax rate, the yellow line, um, is below that, which, uh, which is what the effective tax rate is what corporations actually pay. There's been some recent research in Ireland that the effective tax rate in Ireland is actually 2.2%. Um, parallel with all of this, we look, look at the gap between productivity and average wages. And what this chart does, the top line is, um, uh, shows the uh, uh, labor productivity. In other words, labor productivity, productivity has increased. Uh, 
the bottom line shows um, a, a real wages index. Um, in other words, what has been happening is that the gap, the labor share of uh, national income is actually on the decline sub sub substantially. And increasingly, over that period from 1999, uh, uh, labor share has is, is, is actually declined. If we move quickly to look at what happened in Australia, uh, labor share has, um, uh, the next one, thanks. Labor share was uh, running parallel to about uh, just after 2000, and then uh, that gap is, like it's happened in other countries, that the labor share of national income has started to, in a sense, peter out, whereas productivity and output has continued to in increase. Next one. Um, and also financially, uh, the, the, these are American figures that show the gap between chief executives and the gap between the average typical worker. And that is, is, was a very low level uh, to the mid-1990s, increased rapidly, and has increased back to 2012 to 200, uh, virtually 273% times what the average worker uh, earns. So that gap is, is, is actually increasing. Right. Just, I'll miss this one, I'll come back. Yeah, sorry, I'm just uh, shortening a few things for time. Um, these are, uh, uh, what I want to say next is really about what's happening in the public sector um, and in terms of how neoliberal policies are changing uh, the nature of, of public services. And I've just highlighted here, um, they're not the only objectives, but they're just a summary of the kind of objectives uh, of, of neoliberal policies for the for economies uh, you know, as a whole. In particular, um, there are four factors, uh, uh, four developments of, uh, uh, influencing what's happening within the public sector, particularly in Britain, where we are in a sense uh, 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 a global window for what is the application of neoliberal policies to the public sector. Firstly, there's, about, there's a process of financialization uh, taking place where public money follows um, uh, patients and pupils to schools, irrespective of whether those schools are in the public sector, the private sector, or the non-profit sector. Um, there's higher charges for services. There's wider use of payment by results and outcomes in terms of service delivery contracts, and there's a growth of social, in, of a social investment market and so, social bonds. Okay. Um, there's personalization, which is about how, how services are, are, in a sense, uh, 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 designed around personal budgets, that you're given an allocation to spend, and you have a certain degree of uh, uh, choice about how that money is spent in terms of adult social care, health care, and so on. And while if that is good for people who are in, in have ha a high dependency needs, um, it, this has been wheeled out more widely, and it's got massive implications. It's about the individualization of the welfare, welfare state. Marketization is also uh, happening in terms of the split between the purchaser and provider. Um, and that has been, in a sense, what we could, what's called commissioning in Britain now, and how that's been mainstreamed across the public sector. There's also creation of you know, mixed markets in both public and private sectors. And um, in terms of what's happening in uh, for uh, uh, privatization, I argue that uh, the privatization has mutated. And uh, it's not about, well, it's partly still about the sale of water, energy, and other those those assets, but in a sense, privatization they had to private they had to mutate privatization in order to apply it much on a much wider basis to the welfare state and across public services, in particular local government services in general. And so they've created new pathways um, to outsource and to transfer services and uh, to other agencies. Um, and, and, and also in the way in which those services are financialized and, and marketized at the same time. And there's been a change also within traditional outsourcing, but what we now have is a merger between outsourcing and uh, large public-private partnerships, um, which have expanded into the ser service delivery itself. And that is, have, you know, in the, in the long term, very substantial consequences. Shall you want me to stop? Sorry. <laughs>
Well, just I'll just say two, two things. One thing I was going to say about in terms of the, um, the lessons of what's happened in terms of um, one of the, 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 the documents was produced, um, uh, which are available on the Don Dunson website, was about um, the, the lessons learned from um, uh, various forms of action across Europe. And I think that is really important that, that Australia learns what are the lessons from what, what, what has happened here in terms of those strategies. I'd like to go into more deeper world. I think in conclusion, Australia is in a very strong position to learn the lessons from austerity policies and, um, and, and instead um, implement alternative economic stimulus and investment strategies. In doing so, if it adopted that policy and it, and it put austerity into the ditch where it belongs, um, then it could, um, uh, in a sense, avoid the extensive and, and, and uh, 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 detailed uh, economic and social consequences of, of austerity, which have been uh, basically imposed on, on poor and working class families. It has the opportunity to, to invest in infrastructure and public services and to retain and improve them instead of the flawed short-term outsourcing and privatization, uh, which never uh, achieved their objectives. And also it should strengthen democratic government, participation and transparency, rather than eroded by austerity policies. I'll conclude then. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dexter. We really appreciate those insights into the European UK experience. Uh, we've got a real treat in store for you after a short break. Uh, John Quiggan will be winding up with a discussion uh, on the Australian context, insights into the all-important audit commission process that's going on in Australia at the moment. You'd be aware that uh, the federal government established an audit commission which is investigating the European and US experience and no doubt will be borrowing, uh, unfortunately, from that experience. John's going to provide some insights into that. Um, so we'll have a short 10 to 15 minute break. John will talk for about uh, 30 minutes and then we'll have an opportunity for questions and discussion after that. So uh, just a bit of a, uh, important information, just as you go outside the building, if you turn to your left, there are toilets down this side of the building, I'm, I understand, so very important. Um, enjoy your coffee and the networking and we'll see you back here in a little over 10 minutes time. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know, you see that. I see it. 
Oh, my. No, don't mind. Oh, are they? Okay. Oh, <laughs> so do I. <laughs> 
Welcome back, everyone. We'll just wait for a, a few more people to come in. Okay, everyone, um, I think we'll get underway, so if uh, people could just take their seats, that would be fabulous, thanks. So we're coming into our final session, our final session of austerity. And it's a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor John Quigg. And John's a Hinckley visiting professor at uh, Job, uh, John Hopkins uh, and an Australian Research Council Federation Fellow at the University of Queensland. He's among the top 500 economists in the world, according to uh, Ideas Respect, and is best known for his work on utility theory. He's frequently been recognised for his research, uh, receiving two consecutive Federation Fellowships. His most recent book, I'm sure many of you would be aware of with the uh, absolutely fabulous title that many of us uh, in academia would love to have come up with, Zombie Economics, How Dead Ideas Still Walk Among Us. <laughs> fabulous title. Um, and it's without further ado that I'd like to welcome John Quiggan. Yeah, thanks, John. It's uh, great to be back in my hometown and also back uh, working with the Don Dunstan Foundation, which I've been associated with for quite a long time in, in various ways. So um, I'm going to talk about the Australian scene, and it's different in significant and mostly positive respects from, from what we've heard so far, which doesn't imply, of course, that there isn't uh, a major problem, a uh, major threat posed by the notion of austerity. but. I'll start with one version. It's, of course, a term that has a bunch of different meanings. So, so one version, the, uh, the one that saw the big spike in Dexter's graph, is the notion that the correct way to respond to uh, a financial or economic crisis is for government to cut back, get its, book balance, get its books into balance and uh, leave room for the private sector to expand. That's been the policy prescription coming out of the G20, uh, although uh, many of its proponents, notably the IMF, have backed off significantly in the light of the complete failure of that policy uh, in Europe. Uh, that's still effectively the guiding policy of the other members of the European Troika, of the UK government, uh, and certainly a dominant theme in the politics of, of the US, which, are, as we heard, are sufficiently devolved and complicated that finding any one uh, centre of policy th thinking is kind of difficult. So in Australia, um, we uh, uh, certainly had this kind of thing, I think it's fair to say, uh, at the time of the last big recession, the beginning of that recession uh, in, 19, in 1990, we certainly had plenty of, of austerity kind of rhetoric coming out, but that was eventually largely abandoned in favour of, uh, of fiscal stimulus as the depths of the crisis became apparent. And, uh, at the time of the global financial crisis in, in 2008 and 2009, we certainly had, of course, a large fiscal stimulus which helped us to avoid the impact of the crisis, along with, I have to say, a, a fair bit of luck regarding our, our financial sector. And although the, um, although the uh, federal opposition at the time criticised the stimulus and, and over the course of the Labor government mounted increasing increasingly alarmist rhetoric about debt, along, very much along the lines of its European counterparts, uh, we've seen, I think, already some signals of flexibility on the part of the, on the, part of the, the uh, uh, Abbott and Hockey government. I mean, first, of course, having uh, screamed about the debt ceiling for uh, so many years, their first act was to greatly increase it, and it seems likely that they'll abolish it. I mean, it was a, uh, not a very sensible idea in the first place. And, um, uh, uh, but also we're seeing, uh, and I'll, I'll come to this uh, when I talk in more detail about audit commissions, 
Uh, we're seeing already noises to the effect that uh, should the economic situation decline, uh, as appears quite likely, uh, that we'll see less rather than more austerity as a result. So, um, so certainly uh, having made uh, very big noises uh, appealing to the kind of popular perception of the wisdom of austerity, which I'll come back to if I get, uh, I get some free time, uh, we're seeing, I think, uh, uh, acceptance within the Australian policy uh, community, unlike uh, what we've seen in Europe, that uh, policy should be at least uh, automatically countercyclical. That is, uh, if the budget deficit increases as a result of declining tax revenues, increasing social welfare payments and so forth, uh, we should at least let that happen rather than trying, trying the kind of cutbacks that have, have been seen in Europe. These are what's called in uh, Keynesian fiscal parlance the automatic stabilisers. So there's an acceptance, I think, that, uh, uh, as Keynes put it, uh, the boom, not the slump, is the time for austerity. And while we can criticise the previous government uh, in its later years for fixating on budget surplus, uh, the, broad, the broad outline of its strategy was consistent with that, even if it got itself into uh, some incredible political knots due to ill-advised commitments. So that's, that's, I think, the positive part of the story, but that doesn't imply that we're not going to face uh, serious problems, similar in important respects to what we've heard of uh, uh, in the US and Europe uh, arising from uh, the newly elected government, and in particular uh, from the Commission of Audit. And so I want to uh, I want to talk mainly about commissions of audit, uh, their function uh, and, and their history. And I have only one slide, this brief history, but actually I mean brief, but uh, not that brief. So what we see is that, um, is that whereas if you don't pay really close attention to these things, these sound like big exciting initiatives, actually uh, they're as routine as turning up at government house for the swearing in ceremony except that this is a ritual only conducted by newly elected Conservative governments. But essentially, every Conservative government for the past 25 years on election has announced a commission of audit or something, something very similar. Uh, so there's no sense in which, although of course uh, uh, there's a, a very similar rhetoric about them, this rhetoric is simply applicable whenever there is a change of government, um, I guess. Um, Labor has done uh, some similar things, but in a much more ad hoc sort of way. So this is a, a particular feature of conservative politics. And I guess uh, it's notable the start, because this indicates, uh, uh, sets the tone, uh, the Griner government elected in New South Wales in 1988 appointed uh, Mr Charles Curran, a Sydney stockbroker, uh, to head its first audit commission. And looking around, um, there might be a few people who remember that Mr Curran was in the news earlier in the 1970s as the architect, or the, uh, uh, the uh, plaintiff anyway, uh, in uh, one of the leading tax cases in Australian history, the bottom of the harbour tax cases. Mr Curran uh, successfully employed a bottom of the harbour tax scheme uh, with the result in due course that the Fraser Conservative government was forced to uh, not only retrospect, sorry, legislate retrospectively to illegalise such schemes, but also essentially to uh, denounce the entire approach to tax law that the High Court under Justice Barwick had, had pursued. Uh, so uh, in the 1970s, uh, Mr Curran was doing his best to wreck the finances of the Australian, um, the Australian state, uh, to the point where it was widely said that uh, tax paying was and should be optional, for, uh, at least for upper income taxpayers. So in terms of uh, how, how much concern there is in these exercises for, um, uh, uh, for the kinds of things you might expect uh, from an auditor, uh, the, answer is, um, the answer is not very much. Now, uh, a second point which goes with all of these things, there's really two elements to, um, two elements to the rhetoric that uh, surround the establishment of these, um, of these uh, commissions. Uh, the first is, uh, an attempt to create an era of crisis, uh, which can be blamed on the previous government, which of course is all good politics. I mean, everybody, if you take over the footy club, presumably you point out that everything wrong is due to the last person and that um, all the good things are due to you. That's unsurprising. Uh, the second is a, a, a claim that um, uh, this has been manifested in um, fraud, inefficiency and waste, which can be, um, uh, can be fixed, thereby providing uh, thereby providing uh, substantial improvements in the budget bottom line. Uh, 
Now I've looked at a bunch of these and I think it's fair to say uh, in the narrow definition of these terms uh, this long list of commissions has never uncovered a single instance of fraud, inefficiency and waste. That is, uh, if you look at these reports, uh, they're not about finding, um, uh, finding particular instances of, uh, of for example, uh, public spending being diverted into private pockets or deliberately tolerated inefficiency or uh, projects that have gone on uh, forever to, to no benefit. They're about uh, an ideological uh, agenda uh, essentially, um, and this also I think goes back to the Grider government, essentially the ideological agenda that the Conservative Party would have put up at the election if they were being honest with the voters. Now I don't want to pick particularly on the Conservatives on this side. Uh, Australian politics have become more and more a matter of small target campaigns, but, uh, but it's very notable that Griner in particular presented himself uh, to the New South Wales public as an extremely moderate figure. Uh, as soon as he got into office, became um, uh, revealed himself as, as uh, at least an aspiration, a radical budget cutter and free marketeer, and of course, uh, continuing that pattern, uh, having uh, launched such things as privatisation and PPPs, then enjoyed an exceptionally prosperous post-political career uh, as um, a board member and, uh, of, of companies uh, engaged in this very activity, and all of these patterns. Uh, are fairly common to the uh, fairly common to this uh, entire sequence. So, um, so what we see then is, um, although you know, there is you know, some some effort to um, to actually talk to people within the government and see what's happening. Broadly speaking, what we see is a pre-existing political agenda. Uh, in the case of the uh, current one, uh, laid out very comfortably for us by the Institute of Public Affairs before the election, so we don't really have to look hard, combined uh, with what always exists, a Treasury and Finance Department wish list of all the stuff that they've wanted to kill for ages. Uh, that's the core of these, these reports, and that's why, of course, the, uh, they can usually be delivered in a relatively short period of time, because uh, the report, broadly speaking, could be delivered almost uh, uh, on the day that the Commission was announced, the conclusions are, are effectively, uh, effectively predetermined. What are the elements? Well, I think we've heard, heard a, lot of them, uh, uh, a lot of them from Dexter and Jamie. There's a, a straightforward view of how, how public finances ought to be run. Uh, so one large uh, component of it uh, is the agenda of privatisation, public-private partnerships, marketisation and so forth. Uh, combined, particularly at the federal level, with a um, uh, with a um, a, uh, a desire to cut uh, what are variously called entitlements, middle class welfare, and, and so forth. Um, now, what's Note about, about the politics of these exercises is, as I've said, uh, almost without exception, every newly elected Conservative government has, um, has appointed one of these commissions. But the political circumstances by the time the report gets delivered are very wildly. So, in some cases, the narrative of um, uh, fiscal chaos and emergency created by the profligacy of the previous government and so forth uh, has been highly successful. Uh, uh, Kennett in particular, but also uh, Howard and Costello in, in 1996, and we've seen, um, we've seen the Commission of Audit uh, indeed provide the template for a fairly large-scale program of budget cuts, of radical free market reforms and so forth. In other cases, uh, uh, things, the government by the time the report comes down isn't travelling so well, um, and, uh, and the politics are indeed uh, much less favourable to these kinds of cuts. And so we see the report uh, being released um, in the middle of the Friday night before grand final day, or possibly not at all. Um, a number of these commissions, have their, their final report has, has never been released, and uh, always correlated with the fact that, uh, fact that the report uh, turns out to be politically inconvenient. So broadly speaking, in political terms, uh, what these commissions of audit do is provide incoming Conservative governments uh, with an option. If, uh, if things are going well, they can say, well, you know, we, of course we didn't say very much before the election. It was only after the election, our commission of audit, that we discovered how truly terrible things are. 
uh, phrases like the black hole come to mind. Uh, and therefore, uh, sorry we didn't mention it um, before polling day, but, but we're going to have to have some very big cuts. Um, in other cases, well, uh, no one on the Labor side of politics, after all, is going to complain very much or very effectively that uh, this important report has been suppressed. Um, you can score some points, but not very many, and therefore uh, the exercise uh, goes, goes ahead and, and then is, is simply forgotten. So that's uh, uh, the, core of the, the core of the story. I guess I'll talk a bit now about, um, uh, about the uh, current government and, and the exercise it's undertaking. And I might uh, briefly uh, talk about uh, uh, the two most recent ones I've been involved with, the Newman government a and this one. And I think the, the only thing that's really changed uh, compared to these earlier exercises uh, reflects the increasing degree of tribalism that particularly characterises the right of Australian politics. So that um, uh, while it's very clear that all of these exercises were ideological in nature, there was, in some sense, uh, you know, a coherent view of the public good that uh, underlay them. That is, the people, you know, say, officer who was the leading figure in, in the uh, Kennett and I think uh, also the uh, Howard Costello governments. This is somebody who really believes in small government and is prepared to say it across the board. What we're seeing now is a situation of governments which you know, have a list of friends and a list of enemies. Uh, the enemies are going to be cut, the friends are going to be rewarded. And so we're seeing, you know, we've seen uh, ample opportunities, of course, for the, for the Abbott and Hockey government to reveal these inconsistencies that uh, if you're uh, a worker in the motor vehicle industry, uh, then, uh, uh, then we're very pious about uh, letting government stand on their own two feet. On the other hand, if you're a worker in the car salary packaging industry, which um, you may remember if you saw the uh, before the election, some very piteous sights of people saying they would have to lay off half their salary packages, uh, the people who arrange novated leases and so forth to take advantage of uh, FBT concessions. Uh, fortunately, all those jobs were saved immediately after the election. And thus, if you want to get a tax concession on obviously from 2017 an imported car, um, the people carrying out this vital work have been protected, as of course have uh, you know, workers, for, fortunately for them, who live in Tasmanian electorates, uh, uh, executives from airlines who managed to mismanage themselves while beating up their unions, uh, and farmers are all, are all looking good, other groups are not looking so good. And this has certainly also been very much the case with, with the Newman government, that uh, favoured interests have been rewarded, uh, others haven't. Uh, I mean, that hasn't, this doesn't completely, uh, doesn't completely undermine, of course, the more coherent ideological thrust towards smaller government, but I think it, it certainly already we're seeing from uh, this government a degree of inconsistency uh, in these things much greater than that which we saw from the previous uh, Howard Costello government. And, um, and I think that does reflect, uh, does reflect the fact that uh, so far uh, the rhetoric of auster austerity uh, as a, uh, in general hasn't penetrated the Australian public debate uh, nearly as effectively as, as it's been able to take over uh, and impose itself in Europe. Uh, I think uh, even Howard, for example, towards the end of his term in, term in government was recognising that uh, uh, there is in the public a demand for publicly funded services which, um, uh, uh, which uh, undermine many of his uh, proposals uh, for cuts. I can't really comment on the uh, political situation so much in Europe and the UK, but certainly a striking element in the Australian context which seems to be supported by UK opinion evidence is on things like privatisation. That 20 years after the large-scale privatisations of the, of the 1990s, uh, the mass of the Australian public, and I believe the same is true in the UK, remain opposed to privatisation and, in fact, uh, would support renationalisation of a number of major, major industries. Now, of course, people aren't 100% uh, coherent in these things. Put a proposition, wrap a proposition up one way, and they'll say one thing and wrap it up the other way, and they'll say another. But certainly, I think, uh, the, um, uh, the general ideology of um, what I've called market liberalism in my book uh, remains much less influential in Australia and therefore uh, these kinds of exercises of creating a spurious crisis are, are of 
are of particular importance uh, in uh, providing room for uh, room for a conservative governments uh, first to cut uh, cut areas of public expenditure, as I say, directed uh, in the general sense towards uh, uh, redistribution and greater equity, and in the more specific sense towards uh, groups that are on their list of enemies, uh, creating room for themselves to reward their supporters, both with uh, tax cuts at the top end of the income distribution and also with handouts of various kinds. So, so I think in that sense we are seeing, we're not seeing from, uh, from these governments anymore a really coherent story of austerity uh, uh, so much as the use of austerity rhetoric to mark a much more traditional style of, uh, style of politics. That said, yeah, within the bureaucracy, I think we, within, so not the, really within the policy elite, I think we have a more mixed picture. That is, the majority of the policy elite, I think, are not uh, fortunately convinced of the uh, merits of austerity as a, as a macroeconomic strategy, that is, uh, the vast majority of the people I see in this, uh, in this framework think we did the right thing in 2009 by stimulating the economy, that rhetoric the contrary was, was just that, and that the current government will be well advised, uh, well advised to leave fiscal consolidation for a period when the economy is expanding. On the other hand, I think they are uh, still broadly in the thrall of the 1980s kinds of thinking that, that drive austerity in terms of yeah, the belief that uh, privatisation, marketisation and deregulation are responsible for our current prosperity even though, for example, New Zealand uh, followed almost exactly the same policies uh, uh, and has uh, not prospered at all, uh, largely in my view because of uh, much worse macroeconomic policies. So I think austerity, uh, austerity remains uh, some elements of the austerity ideology remain exceptionally influential in the Australian context, at least among the elite. Uh, others, not so much so. Uh, I think uh, the politics of the situation are different and, uh, and more favourable. Of course, it remains to be seen how Australia would in fact cope with uh, you know, the collapse, a collapse in the housing market, for example. It may be that these, uh, uh, these ideas would turn out to have more currency than, um, uh, than I've argued here. Uh, hopefully, we won't uh, won't see that happening. So I guess I'll, I'll stop there and uh, open it up. Uh, we're going to have our panel discussion after this, I think. Thanks very much, John. And now we have an opportunity for you to ask some questions and engage in some conversations with our three presenters today. And we've got some roving mics here, I think. So if you just want to put your hand up and uh, tell us your name and just a, a brief question, if, if you like. Any hands up? You're just here on the left-hand side in the middle here. Thank you. This is uh, Glenda. Um, just a comment on what you think our status is on the G20 and what you think our influence is going to be in there and the outcomes from that? Yeah, I, I guess I'm generally underwhelmed by, by bodies like the G20. Um, yeah, I think obviously they're an opportunity for, uh, opportunity particularly uh, hosting them for governments to, to grandstand in various ways. I, I really doubt that uh, it will have more than the ephemeral significance, though I don't think that, I don't think, as I've said, that uh, the, our government has a sufficiently coherent uh, domestic agenda that uh, its aim of showcasing that agenda will, uh, uh, will achieve much. Of course, um, uh, the only area where it's, it's notably distinctive is that of climate change, and I think they'll be getting a pretty frosty reception on that issue. Hi, I'll disclose I'm a Greens Member of Parliament. My name is Tammy Franks. Um, but in your narrative about commissions of audits, you talked about conservative governments. Yet in South Australia in 2010, we had what was called the Sustainable Budget Commission, which was actually uh, launched by a Labor government eight years into its term, and then indeed leaked. So in fact, their cuts looked less worse than they could have been. Um, do you have any comment on how Labor governments use these commissions of audit? Uh, sure, I think, um, I mean, we have seen these kinds of exercises at various times, and, and as I said, I think um, 
broadly speaking, you know, the class, the, uh, you know, the, the people who are currently at the head of Labor governments uh, are broadly still thinking in terms of the 1980s Hawke and Keating uh, type agenda. I don't think they have the same political function, so I think, you know, un I think uh, to some extent they're probably more generally motivated by an actual desire to, um, uh, to reduce spending and bring the budget into balance more than, uh, more than the kind of um, uh, political cover that's uh, granted here. But I think there's no doubt that, um, no doubt that those ideas remain exceptionally influential uh, at all levels. The, the global financial crisis shot people out of it to, some, you know, to a significant extent, but certainly in, in the, you know, I, haven't, I haven't followed South Australian development so closely, but certainly uh, in response to the Bly government in uh, Queensland, which were of course utterly uh, electorally disastrous, but also the federal Labor government, uh, we saw a tension between, um, between the wanting to claim correctly the success of the stimulus policy and the pull of past ideas, and Swan in particular, I think, uh, on the one hand gave Keynesian rationales for, uh, for uh, you know, trying to drive the budget back to surplus, but you could see also was trying as best he could in other respects to make, to treat the crisis as a once-off event that uh, should not guide our thinking in any way. Yeah, hi, uh, Andrew Craig. Um, just wanted to follow on from what was talked about earlier about Detroit. So there's certain cities in the US that have naturally suffered a lot, as well as certain states in the US that I understand too have been quite uh, on the edge of uh, going bankrupt or have gone bankrupt. And just trying to uh, understand how do you weigh up the, that, that tension, and, you know, the different schools of thought as to you know, increasing public debt and and uh, but then that burgeoning debt that becomes a fiscal cliff and and uh, puts things in peril. You know, how do you balance that? How do you what what would you see as the way forward for communities in peril? You know, such as certain communities uh, with manufacturing crises and and the loss of um, jobs and such like. Um, yeah, it is true that um, there's been some discussion of um, whether states themselves might be. Uh, entering periods of bankruptcy. Technically, they're not allowed to go bankrupt under the federal bankruptcy code in the US. Uh, but uh, that the sort of Republican establishment has been pressing that case. Uh, Newt Gingrich, Jeb Bush, and others have been making the case that states also should be allowed to join the bankruptcy code. Um, and I think it reflects this logic of wanting to um, isolate the effects, the, uh, localize the effects of uh, economic stress and to make them, to ensure they're dealt with within a governmental unit. Um, and it reflects the fact that bankruptcy is the, the absolute flip side of redistribution and investment and intergovernmental transfers. So it's a general uh, critique of that uh, sort of Keynesian position, which has been under attack and dismantlement in the US for many, uh, many years. <clears throat> so, I mean, I think what um, the question as to what individual states and cities can do um, really calls for a different kind of settlement, I think, in the, in the American political system. You need a different, there's an anti-city um, political settlement in the US, uh, which really works against local interests more generally. Uh, there's very little redistributive uh, spending now left in that system. Um, so without a different kind of national politics around this, I think there is limited scope uh, for localities or states to save themselves. Um, they've been forced to do that for the last 20 or 30 years by going to the bond markets. So the so-called muni bond market has ex extra is now, I think, worth something like six uh, billion dollars, massive bond market. And, and most local spending is now done through the bond market, which is creating another kind of bubble. Um, so without a wider political settlement, it's hard to see what states and uh, localities, localities can do. Um, in uh, countries where we're seeing austerity have such a, a strong grip, um, and, and you guys are all working in those uh, places. What do you see breaking through as the messages for, I, d I don't know what the opposite of austerity is, let's call it stimulus, um, that, that's, that's working? You know, obviously there is 
a lot of people impacted, especially low-income people, and there is a left-wing agenda there somewhere. We hope it hasn't moved too far to the right. But um, what, what is working for your messages? Where do you see a glimmer of hope? Okay, well, I'll take the first crack at that. Uh, as the most pessimistic person uh, sitting here, um, yeah, the black holes that I'm looking into uh, are not uh, very hopeful, uh, I have to confess. Um, uh, Milton Friedman used to say uh, that the ideas of the, uh, of the right um, had to be assembled, uh, articulated and readied for the moment to which they could be put to use. Uh, and he had a famous line about only a crisis uh, provides the moment to act. Um, uh, and in, I think what we've seen se it's several times through recent history uh, is the effectiveness of conservative actors in moments of crisis to shape a narrative about appropriate uh, responses to that crisis. The striking thing to me about the GFC, uh, witnessing that from North America, uh, was the dramatic failure generally of the left to articulate a pathway out of that crisis. Um, so there was a feeble uh, version of stimulus spending uh, in the United States, probably half the size that it should have been according to Paul Krugman and, and others, um, uh, much of it associated with tax cuts rather than real expenditures. Um, and even that relatively modest stimulus package in the US has been subject to relentless political attack uh, since, uh, such that I don't think Obama would have the courage uh, to go back there. Um, and so I think we've seen the arguments won um, by the right uh, successively and um, uh, unfortunately much of the response on the left has been to move towards localist, uh, enclavist strategies frankly. Um, not to grapple with these big questions of macroeconomic management and so on and there. So I think the silence on parts of the left in 2008 and, and since has, has come at a considerable price. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to give, I guess, a more optimistic take. I mean, I think, well, the first point is um, yeah, politics in the US, as of 2008, were entirely dominated by the right. I mean, Obama, I think, has described himself and certainly would be correctly described as a moderate Republican. Uh, you had no, no significant left-wing voice and an acceptance by Obama, by, by, by all the people who might have been Democrat candidates for the, for the presidency, of a bunch of claims about US society which had been known to be false for many years, uh, trickle down, uh, the belief that the US, uh, despite being highly unequal, even that fact was disputed for some time, was a highly mobile society, disputes about the extent of these things. All of those things have collapsed in the space of the past five years, partly just, uh, the, we saw Joe Stiglitz talking, uh, he c very successfully coined the phrase the 1% and, and that's now you know, a routine code word in the US in a way that would have been just unthinkable 10 years ago to that the phrase the 1% is understood by everybody and it's understood by everybody that, that the 1% has gained more than everybody else and it's understood by everybody uh, that they are increasingly pulling up the drawbridges behind them to ensure that their kids will be the next, the next 1%. So that's a, a pretty fundamental transformation, I think, in US political discourse, because the belief in the US as a land of opportunity is as deeply embedded as the Australian belief in mateship and so forth. It's, it's a challenge to very fundamental beliefs about the US that's taken hold, to the point that even Republicans are having to, uh, having been in denial for a long time, and now having to rephrase their rhetoric in terms of uh, recreating the American dream of opportunity rather than defending it. And so I think, I, yeah, I think, uh, these things move incredibly slowly. Friedman, I mean, to, to put the point a bit further, Friedman was a voice in the wilderness for a very long time. What he was saying was, here are the right ideas, but we, you know, in the environment of the US in the 1960s and 50s, when he was first put in these points, uh, he wasn't getting any traction. All he could say is, let's get our ideas ready uh, for the right time. Th so that requires not only the objective events like the crisis, but also the political forces. I see that as much more positive in the US, much less so, I have to admit, in uh, looking from afar at Europe, but um, maybe Dexter. Thanks. Um, I think there's been a, um, a, a what, you, what 
what the question that was sort of raised is, 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 is very fundamental. And I think there has been a, um, a pretty abject failure um, in, in terms of uh, you know, developing alternative policies and alternative strategies to, to austerity. Um, in the, um, the third, third of the, the briefing, series of briefings, um, we do set out a, set, a, a series of uh, alternative policies and strategies. Um, and it does you know, make some reference to uh, uh, initiatives that have come from European uh, Trade Union uh, Confederation uh, through uh, Euro Memo Group and, and one or two other organizations. Um, we've begun that process of trying to articulate and to develop uh, an, al an alternative to, uh, uh, to, a, to a s a austerity. And I think that is, uh, has been a fundamental flaw in, in the strategy um, and you know, basically a failure by both by the left and by you know, the trade union movement as a whole. I think the other failure is, which is a, which are one of the things I was going to, I didn't have time to spell out in, in uh, my presentation, but I think it's also a failure in terms of um, the way that the trade union movement in particular, but not solely them, but you know, civil society organizations and community organizations have also responded um, to um, uh, the, the austerity agenda. Yes, there was an absence of um, a, a clear articulation of alternative policies, although that is now beginning to change. Um, but also the strategies that were, were uh, developed uh, were also fundamentally flawed in my view. Um, for, for example, um, in Britain what happened was local campaigns um, set up anti-cuts uh, uh, committees. And so austerity was, was defined in many places by an anti-cuts um, ideology and ide anti-cuts uh, 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 um, organization, if you like. And you know, what over time it has proved that uh, simply anti-cuts movements are incredibly defensive and have really not achieved anything. And what, what they, most of them ended up achieving was shifting the, 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 the burden from one group to another. It wasn't disabled uh, uh, um, um, uh, service users. It, it was another group who, who actually bore the, bore, bore the cuts. But there was no change, or no changes were achieved in the overall um, uh, public spending uh, framework, if you like. Um, and I think that, that, that is both, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is, is the way that you know, there's been a failure by the trade unions to have any clear strategy to intervene in um, that whole transformation of public services. And so the, the idea of outsourcing and privatization has become increasingly um, Britain and in other countries uh, seen as you know, the answer, the way forward. But that is the route to make cuts in public spending and to restructure the workforce and things. And there is, you know, all the work we've done over the last 40 years, um, uh, mounting evidence that uh, outsourcing and privatization does not achieve the objectives. It, it's not a way of actually achieving cuts in, in, uh, in uh, expenditure on services, because they always, you know, as John mentioned in his speech, they all come bouncing back. So there's, there's, there's been a failure in terms of response to, to austerity, but there's a failure in, in response to um, that neoliberal agenda within the, within the public sector. But I'm an optimist. I think there are, you know, I think there is a, a framework of an alternative st strategy. Um, we'll have debates and we, we all, we'll, we'll never agree precisely in terms of the, 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 those policies. But I, you know, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm much less optimistic about what's going to happen in the States, because I think it's, 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 there's a different set of politics, different structure in terms of, you know, of local government than there is you know, within, within Europe. And within Europe, there is still very much, a, um, uh, despite the, the brutality that has gone, there is still a faith in a degree of collective prov uh, provision um, and in terms of you know, meeting social needs um, by the state. So I'm, you know, I would remain optimistic, although I think the I you know, idea that somehow we're going to get growth, we're going to get um, a recovery in the way that people talk about is, is, you know, is myopic and it's not going to work. It's going it's to be a long process 
and we've got to really prepare ourselves for that long process. Um, Jamie Peck has talked about how the right wing and the business community are organised, have a plan to step in as soon as there's some sort of crisis. And this, of course, is the basis of Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine. Um, what we, what in my view we need is um, somehow for people of a different persuasion to get their act together and to perhaps come and prepare a, a salvation doctrine. Um, can uh, any of our speakers see who might be able to effectively achieve that? Well, I, ultimately, um, I firmly believe that. Sorry, but I firmly believe that um, uh, we have to develop. We have to, in a sense, rethink, redesign um, the role of trade unions um, to make them, uh, to uh, you know, um, more radical um, and more open and democratic. Um, and and in, in my view, the real uh, the, there's an opportunity um, to, in a sense, build uh, coalitions and alliances on a much different scale than has been achieved so far uh, between trade unions, community organisations, um, uh, political parties on the left, and also in terms of uh, the, the civil society organisations, if you like, and. The fact is that um, there have been examples of that. There is, the, it is a fact that there are moves to do that through the development of worker centers in the states, the change in the AFL-CIO, which is equivalent, US equivalent of the ACTU, um, having a much more open door, bringing in organizations of different kinds, student organizations, community organizations, to be part of a broader umbrella so in other words, I think we have to, in a sense, effectively reorganize and re, re, redesign that, that framework. If we keep on going as we are in terms of a fragmented and increasingly powerless trade union movement and separate community organization movement and separate uh, civil society organizations, we're going to get hammered to hell and we're going to achieve nothing. There has to, we have to build mechanisms of unity and, and you know, strength will, co will come from that, come from that. Yeah, I'll take a crack at that one as well. Um, I mean, we should remember, I mean, uh, historically that um, as the right started to organize itself in the period after the, in the thirties and in the forties, um, um, it did so as John mentions largely in the wilderness and uh, um, and uh, essentially as people who'd lost the argument during the Great Depression. And the an inspiration for, uh, for those long-range thinkers like Hayek and Friedman and so on uh, was the m movement that the Fabians had led in the end of the 19th century which had propagated welfare state arguments and so on. And, and they, they argued that, they needed a that the right needed a long-range strategy for intellectual realignment. Um, which they pursued largely in the wilderness for many decades until there was an opportunity to act. Um, now, you, they couldn't have predicted um, as they sat there on, in the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947 that they would get that opportunity in the mid-1970s with stagflation, which was the moment that paralyzed the Keynesian apparatus and many of its arguments uh, for a period of time. Um, but. Uh, but they did actually have those uh, arguments ready for use in that situation. Um, so what I think what this, we can draw a number of lessons from this. Um, I don't think um, ideas change history in the re relatively straightforward sense. Uh, but I do think it's important to have um, an ideational framework and a template for action and some shared principles uh, when they're most needed. Um, so we shouldn't be assembling our arguments against austerity now. We should have had them in 2007 or much earlier, of course. Um, so uh, what could we turn to to inspire a re some sort of reconstruction? Um, for me, it will be ideas around social and ecological justice. And I've done work for many years 
um, on the Tea Party and the conservative movements in the United States and spend a lot of time talking to these people. Um, if they have a long-range concern, it is the fact that climate change um, actually gives the I initiative back to the left and calls for new forms of new thinking about intervention, um, uh, and maybe even new forms of coordination globally and so on. Um, so in a sense, there are major challenges in front of us which I think require different kinds of solutions. And we really do see only zombie arguments, I think, from conservatives on those fronts at the moment, especially environmental uh, of climate change and so on, where they seem to be trying to hang on to denial as long as possible. Uh, that reflects a complete bankruptcy of their ideas uh, with respect to the impact of climate change, and I would also say social inequality. So there are major systemic challenges for, for which call forth, I think, new kinds of responses, and, and it's the responsibility of the the left to articulate a bolder vision for those, not a timid form of pragmatism, which is fortunately has passed uh, for left politics in the last 20 years or so, uh, but something that seizes that historical moment. So going to the level of absolute cliche, I'm going to rely on youth. Um, I think um, to say something serious about this, I mean, people's political views are largely formed in early adulthood, and I think the current political class is saturated with the market liberalism, as I've said, of, of the 1980s. Um, not, uh, we're very much in the minority. Uh, uh, people of my age in, in not sharing those views. Uh, so, and that is certainly very much true of the people you know, I've run across in the, in the Labor Party of, of my age. They have, have uh, in many cases, excellently progressive views on a range of social issues, but on anything to do with economics. Uh, their thinking is is almost indistinguishable from that of, of um, uh, that that of the other side of politics, which won these victories, as was said in the late seventies. If you look at uh, and so the, the experience, of course, of people growing up then was one of the failure of Keynesianism, uh, certainly the perceived failure, uh, and the rise of, of market liberalism as as the um, perceived solution, uh, and that really has dominated the thinking, I think, of everybody who's gone you know, into mainstream politics, the vast majority over the age of about 30. Uh, by contrast, yeah, people, uh, young people uh, in the US, less so in Australia, but in the US, uh, have experienced the, the sharp end of this stuff, equally so in Europe. I mean, if we ask why this has been politically sustainable, I think one reason is that, uh, as we've shown, that the burden has really been shifted onto the least politically active parts of the uh, parts of the society. I mean, obviously, looking at those numbers, austerity hasn't been so bad for lots of you know, people of a certain age employed, particularly in the private sector. Uh, you see this, for example, in the striking result that for Americans under 30, the majority say they prefer socialism to capitalism. Now, what they mean by socialism, I suspect, is you know, Democrats with a bit of a spine or something of that kind. I mean, anything, you know, anything in the any, anything. You know, anything in the US is described as socialism, and therefore I, I don't imagine that most of these people uh, you know, want to institute central planning and, um, and, and labor allocation, no, but, uh, but they, they have heard the words, they've heard the words of the people who praise capitalism and denounce socialism, uh, and they've judged, well, if, those, if socialism is what those people are against, then I'm for it. And, um, and so I think there really is, uh, there really, there really is that. Yeah, you know, the climate change issue adds to this, adds to and reinforces all this. But I think we, yeah, we do have the opportunity, uh, in the generation of people who have, who have entered this appalling labour market, um, and and yeah, can expect, as the evidence shows, to permanently lose out as a result of this. I think the core of people who who will shake off the kind of political, uh, the mental fetters of of market liberalism, which, as I say is entirely dominant in, in the political class of people of my age. We've got a few questions up the back, and then I might get uh, our microphone people to move into the middle to just to enable some of our people in the middle to have a uh, This is a, professor, well, a uh, question to you, Professor Quiggan, and other panellists uh, might want to dip in. Microphone. No. <laughs> <laughs> professor Quiggan, this is a question for you, and your other panellists might want to dip into it if they wish. I have to speak up. 
Um, much of the regressive and distributionist economics that all three of you have spoken about, you covered in your book, which is a bloody hard read, I might say, of four years ago, um, zombie economics, where you identified, I think, five or six central tenets of neoliberalism and comprehensively demolished all of them. And yet, and yet, I can pick up the daily financial press, turn the commentary on radio and television, and the zombies that you identified are in play proportion. When will they be killed off? How and when? Yeah, well, as, as we've said a few times, I think, uh, this is an incredibly long process. Um, you know, Mont Pelerin Society in 1948 sat around doing nothing. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a mistake to think that, uh, that these things can be achieved overnight. Those of us who are professional dealers and ideas, I guess, like to think that, you know, as I say, my book is a complete demolition of these ideas. Of course, everybody will simply read it and realise how could I have been so wrong and, um, uh, and change. Sadly, uh, a lot of, it requires, lot of it requires generational replacement or at least shunting aside of, of uh, people. I think, for example, yeah, perhaps the Labor Party is now cured of privatisation. We'll, we'll see. Certainly, um, certainly the lesson has been administered uh, with a fair bit of ferocity in Queensland, so we'll, we'll wait and see how that plays out. But, um, uh, but yeah, I think, think this just is, is a long struggle and it's important to recognise how deeply these ideas are ingrained in the thinking even of you know, people who are you know, superficially reasonable and person, people of goodwill, these assumptions have been, have been uh, led into the policy elite for the last 30 years. They're not going to go away uh, any time uh, easily. The, the struggle just has to carry on as the Fabians did, as on the other side uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, the free market right did during their long decades in the wilderness. I just wanted to say um, I, I, I'm aware that a few people will probably trickle out over the next 15 or 20 minutes uh, and there is one thing that uh, everyone can do and the Don Dunson Foundation intends that this project Unmasking Austerity is an ongoing project. In the short term of course uh, the Federal Government will release the Audit Commission report and there's an opportunity to do a detailed analysis of that and I would hope my colleagues here would work with us uh, on doing a detailed unpacking of the implications of the Audit Commission report and beyond that looking at what the alternatives are. So um, if you do need to leave early please think about how you might be able to contribute to that because your support for the Don, Don, Don Dunson Foundation financial donations to this particular project can help it happen. Thanks. I, I just wanted to take this chance to um, do my own bit of zombie talk as a uh, uh, I've not written a book as well known as uh, John's, but um, I described the uh, moment of the GFC as a moment of zombie neoliberalism um, uh, on the grounds that um, uh, zombies, of course, are dead from the neck up, uh, but they still move and uh, they do uh, incredible damage and march towards the warm-blooded parts of society. Uh, I don't think that's a fairly reasonable description of uh, how austerity politics have operated. Um, the limbs are still moving and doing great damage, uh, but the mental facilities, the mental capacity has been seriously damaged. And I think in two respects. Firstly, that the intellectual rationales for uh, austerity and neoliberal interventions have been shown to be extremely flimsy, uh, and so in a sense, winning the intellectual argument is something that uh, neoliberals don't really do anymore. Uh, they've got this kind of grip on the common sense and real politic, but I think they're losing the intellectual argument. And the second point is that moral leadership, as uh, Gramsci called it, um, is not being produced through the neoliberal project in the way that it was before 2008. Um, we no longer can be told that this is good for us all. Uh, and there's a, a sunlit future awaiting everybody once we go through a temporary period of pain. Instead, our political leaders are having to tell us that prolonged, extended uh, agony is required um, with a very uncertain future. So I think this is a very different moment in politics from, let's say, the 1980s where Thatcher and Reagan and others could articulate a brighter future. Um, and so I think there is this kind of death from the neck up of some of this project, which may, means it has entered a different kind of stage, if in, even if it continues to do damage. 
Uh, g'day, my name's Phil. Um, while we're fighting this rearguard action against austerity and you know, the expenditure side of, of the ledger, um, we went to a fantastic conference the other day by SACOS about tax. Um, and w it was outlined how many billions we've lost um, since the tax cuts of the Howard and Rudd eras. Um, how do we, while we're fighting this rearguard action against expenditure cuts, um, have a civilised debate about uh, the values of um, a civil taxation? No, I was, sorry, yeah, I was we're, we're sort of th thought we were maybe collecting questions at this point. So, so I think, um, I mean, it, this is an important question, and, and I think we saw, um, uh, yeah, we, we've, we've again sort of, yeah, I mean, I think it's at two levels. I mean, one again is that a central part of this shared common sense ideology is, is you know, dating right back, I mean, you can literally date this back to the trilogy commitment, which was 1984, I think that the, the tax share of GDP should not be allowed to rise. You know, the belief that holding down the tax share will stimulate the economy. Uh, it's a version, you know, a slightly different version of trickle down. You know, that belief is, is you know, pretty much a shared, a shared common among, among all those people whose ideas were formed in the 1980s, as I've said. Uh, then you combine it with the political opportunism, you know, how it very opportunely did this stuff of giving great big tax cuts immediately before an election to preclude uh, spending promises. Rudd felt compelled to match most of them, not all of them. I, mean, I suppose the positive point to make is obviously over a very long period, bracket creep will gradually wind this stuff back. Uh, we haven't seen from this government as yet um, much of a commitment to, to further tax cuts, which is about the best you could say. Uh, we did see uh, in the, the very brief uh, Rudd government, some attempts to the second one to, to restore uh, various aspects of the tax system, notably the FBT tightening uh, and some other some other features there. So I think the argument is yeah the, there's, the argument has to some extent um, made progress, uh, but there is again still this uh, this absolute belief that the tax share of GDP should never increase, which uh, is inconsistent. So I suppose um, sorry for my thoughts. What we've seen, on the other hand, is an acknowledgement, again, even by the Conservatives, that initiatives like the National Disability Insurance Scheme, like Gonski, need to happen. Those things imply an increase in expenditure that can't easily be, be, uh, be cut. I think uh, the talk of an end to the age of entitlement rapidly runs up against the fact that they're not really willing to do very much about the old age pension, which is by far the biggest of those, and that attempts to secure much money by punishing the unemployed further w won't go far. So I think there is a contradiction there uh, that, um, that can be exploited, but it again requires a willingness on, on the part of people on the left of politics to actually advocate for the benefits of, of tax revenue and public spending, which uh, rather than relying on, on bracket creep, which with low rates of inflation and fairly, tax, fairly flat tax scales works in a very slow sort of way. Hi, uh, Trish Trioli here. It's a bit late in the piece, I guess, for this topic, but I'm just interested in Iceland, and they seem to have shown some moral leadership in not fully bailing out their banks, but actually um, sending some to jail. That's what I understand from the reading. I'd like some comment on what they did, how they did it, and um, whether it's working. Um, my other question is um, to Jamie, in terms of the US, is there any um, evidence of a new language of class around the ideas of the arrestable class and the unarrestable class as a distinction? The arrestable class, is that the phrase you used? Um, <coughs> uh, well, there's not much new language of class, I don't think, in the United States, but um, one of the things that uh, that I think you referred to with that uh, phrase is the uh, uh, the rate of incarceration there now is uh, uh, higher than any other um, country in the world uh, and is especially a racialized pattern of incarceration uh, more than two million people behind bars um, in the United States 
Um, uh, and so you've got, uh, uh, I think, the, essentially what happened to the displaced working class after deindustrialization in the United States, at least communities in communities of color, uh, was incarceration uh, and welfare state withdrawal. Um, the welfare state in the U.S. has been restructured to the point of uh, almost nothing now. It's really only available to uh, single parents in a very limited kind of way. Um, and so the, the future that is in front of especially African-American young, young men is a future of incarceration, uh, which affects uh, around 70% of all African-American young men in American cities like Baltimore, uh, Chicago, and so on. So this is the, the normal experience uh, for working class black Americans is incarceration. They're more likely to be in prison than in jobs. Uh, and that, the long run consequences of that in the US system are very difficult to uh, unwind. Um, I think we can see this as a, a measure of the fact that the, uh, the vision of uh, creating a smaller state in the United States has largely uh, uh, been um, uh, uh, a failure, uh, given that the state has shrunk in some areas and grown in others. It's grown in terms of military commitments and, uh, uh, and in terms of incarceration. Um, so the, the total size of the U.S. state as a proportion of GDP um, has not dropped significantly since the Reagan years. This is one of the things that uh, annoyed Milton Friedman until he went to his grave. Uh, but I think that is because social externalities pile up in other parts of the state and create different kinds of demands. The United States could afford a fairly civilized welfare state if it recommitted its uh, prison spending to that, to those social needs. But instead, it's operated a punitive uh, policy towards the poor. Uh, thanks. Karen Atherton from uh, Community and Public Sector Union. I'll just say the feedback's a bit weird. Um, I'm here with a number of other trade unionists today. So um, I'd like to acknowledge, I think, that what you've said about the trade union movement, um, we didn't claim the victory enough in 2007, um, but there's an enormous amount of work going on at the moment to talk about um, a fairer economic vision, um, getting the Australian community on board for that. So that really plays into what I think you've been saying here today. I think the other thing that would be useful for this group to know is that there's an, a few organisations around that are looking at trying to get together and create that progressive narrative about the world that we want to live in. And the work here today is a really important part of that, but there's a group called Centre for Australian Progress that is bringing together um, people from across civil society, the union movement um, and other progressive organisations to work on that. So I think there is some hope and also the Commission of Audit, as much as it is a threat, I think is also an opportunity to actually uh, shine a light on some of these issues. And the current Senate inquiry into it has been enormously helpful um, in creating an opportunity to get the alternate economic argument out there. Um, to get some of those numbers out there as well. So there's some things happening um, that we can play into. But if you want the trade union movement to take a lead in this, if you're not a member, join, talk to your kids about joining, sign up to the SA Union's website. We've got a state election on. So I know this is a bit of a plug, but um, we have to use the energy and the fabulous ideas that have come out of something today and just not leave that when we leave the room. So thank you. It's really good to actually name the problem, um, see an example of how it plays out elsewhere, but let's not miss this opportunity to take it on and uh, use this as much as we can. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'd just uh, like you to comment on um, what you think, uh, the what part you think the uh, current structure of the media industry plays in all of this and uh, do you see any uh, hope in the current failure or, or uh, decline of the newspapers in Australia? This is uh, clearly one for John, but I'll just make a quick comment about the US media. media. I think the, um, there's a kind of triangular relationship that's established between uh, the conservative think tanks, the Wall Street Journals, uh, 
uh, editorial page and, um, and, and Fox News and, and that kind of parallel universe in which uh, an alarming number of people live, um, where you only get one narrative about the, the ails of the country and appropriate responses. Um, it means I think we really see a kind of balkanized media environment in the United States. Um, and there's an entirely new channel that's being constructed now, uh, which re really just recirculates um, the same kinds of uh, solutions to, to extant uh, problems. So I think the media, the restructuring of the media in the United States has certainly been a very important part of this overall transformation. Yeah, I mean, a comment, I guess, I mean, that restructuring, um, particularly you know, the Murdoch press in Australia and, and the US, in the short term has been a source of great strength for the right, but I think in the medium term, and I think we're already seeing this in the US, has actually been disastrous for them because um, it really, you know, as Dexter was saying, the, you know, the, it's effectively poisoned the entire well of, of the right wing intellectual apparatus, uh, the point where the point where in particular uh, the centrist group who really for, for many, many years utterly dominated thinking in the US, the so-called serious people, always took the view that um, the truth must be somewhere in the middle and so the further right the Fox News and people tacked, the further right they went to, to you know, by definition, to, to pursue the centrist program. I think uh, that, that, med that uh, Murdoch media has now lost credibility to the point where uh, they can simply be dismissed. I think that's true of the Australian here. I don't. Yeah, I think not only lefties don't. I think people in the in the centre of politics recognise that the Australian isn't a serious newspaper. It's a propaganda organ, uh, and that that in turn un yeah, that uh, that undermines its usefulness for for the right. So I think that's one set of developments that are sort of taking place uh, cross cutting. Media, so you, so you see exactly the same kinds of phenomenon in the blog world and, and similar. That that there is this large, incredibly crazy uh, block of, of thought that goes along with the Australian, the Murdoch press, and so forth. Uh, the other development, of course, is is the decline of um, uh, the decline of, of newspapers in particular, uh, at, and the growth of social media at its expense. That's had both positive and negative consequences. But I think on the whole. Uh, on the whole, more positive that uh, uh, that in terms of actually uh, opening the space up to ideas, because the new ideas are happening on the left now. We're only seeing a repetition of failed ideas on the right. I think, think the left, on the whole, has made better use of these new media than, than has the right. And certainly, certainly the complaints from the right about Facebook and Twitter suggest that they s they perceive these media a, a, as dominated by by the left. It's of course, because they are very selective, it's very hard to get a, a real feel for what's happening. Um, you know, I see what my friends and their friends are saying, but uh, obviously not what Rupert says or what his friends say, but, but, but certainly you do, f slipping across that board, I see lots of complaints from right-wingers saying that uh, isn't it terrible how there are all these lefties on Twitter and you know, on Facebook uh, saying terrible left-wing things. G'day, I've just been in uh, Europe for five years studying governance of the European Union from political science and I think there's something perhaps in your uh, studies that is being underestimated in the sense that while in Australia the audit commissions might not be finding fraud, inefficiency and waste and therefore the rhetoric of austerity is somewhat reduced in Australia. Um, in Europe, uh, there's massive variation, but particularly the countries that are uh, under the austerity programs have got massive, massive corruption, where huge numbers of the citizens have to pay bribes to get basic s services, um, and the, the government just doesn't work, basically, uh, for, for some people in Greece and Spain and Italy. So I was wondering whether you could uh, comment on that. I get these questions. Um, um, I think there's um, uh, the question of corruption is is very important. Um, 
and I can't talk really about uh, Europe as a whole. I can talk about certainly, you know, Britain, uh, Ireland, according to others. Um, but I, I think that uh, certainly in the Irish context, corruption is uh, uh, well established, well embedded, um, and uh, uh, not you know the whole austerity program, the whole bailout program, um, is is done nothing to to change that. If anything, it's probably uh, embedded it even even further, um, and. Uh, there are other, uh, obviously, in terms of there's other countries in Europe, in t t certainly in terms of Eastern Europe, um, there are major, particularly those who are new into the Union in, in the last 10 years, um, there are major issues around uh, corruption which uh, have been recognized as problematic um, and that something needs to be done about it. And although, I, you know, I see references now and again to that there are initiatives taking place, but it seems to me that, um, that, that very little has, has actually happened, and I think it, it is a, you know, a, a, major, a major problem. I think, you know, in the Irish, just going back to the Irish context, um, there is a, re a recognition increasingly that um, uh, that, that is a, a, a fundamental problem, particularly in a, 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 a country that is in denial that it's a tax haven, but it's quite clearly a tax haven. Um, and uh, which is only one di dimension of the uh, one aspect of that, of, of that sort of level of corruption. But there are s significant changes taking place in terms of legislation um, um, which are addressing the re that recognition that there is, you know, that it is uh, a corrupt uh, uh, country, and in particular, trying uh, moving from things from local government and, and at local level from community um, and sort of town councils and county councils and moving those up into a, a sort of nas national legislation is seen as the way of actually, uh, and particularly for, around, for example around planning policy uh, where Ireland ends up with, with a, a, a landscape of houses on every bloody field, um, um, which is, you know, I'm not saying it's all a result of cor corruption, but a massive amount of it is. If it is. And that, that has been dealt with by, you know, increasing national legislation, but in a sense, it's a, it's a direct opposite of localism. It's taking powers away from, the, from local government in order to, you know, in a sense, address that, that element of, of corruption. We just have a few rapid fire questions to ask as we're coming to the close, and uh, yeah, just uh, just in the middle, and then, and then here. Yes, I don't know if this can be rapid fire because it's been. <laughs> gelling more and more in my mind as, as people have been talking. Uh, first of all, talking about unions. Unions are the w important element of, of a, new, uh, a new direction. We have to distinguish within <coughs> unions. At the moment, I'm quite puzzled why the Abbott government wants to make an attack on union corruption because my understanding of union corruption when I was doing my PhD on uh, union militancy 30 years ago was that union corruption were officials who got paid by employers to damp down on worker militancy and got uh, new Ford cars every year. Uh, and I don't doubt that much of that still goes on and that the weakness of trade unions and the stagnation of wages has precisely got to do with that kind of corruption. So I would point to what I want to point, I will be brief now, two elements of hope. One would be these new generation of young people in what were described as mini jobs. It's from the rank and file, the particularly oppressed rank and file of trade union membership or of workers uh, that you can get a rejuvenation of the trade union movement. Um, second point, I was delighted to hear that the Tea Party is scared of action on climate change. I hadn't quite realized this. Uh, and it seems to me that we are now, this year, last year, the last two or three years, entering a quite new era on climate change in which scientists are no longer saying it's the great threat of the future. They're saying it's happening now. It's the cause of the British floods. It's the cause of the fires in, uh, in New South Wales. Um, and I think the public is already ahead of the scientists in uh, seeing that 
has uh, a causal connection which needs action. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, talking of localism, I'm the Deputy Mayor of a local uh, government council. So thank you, gentlemen, for your presentations, especially Jamie for the warnings. <laughs> um, but in my spare time, I'm a student of discourse analysis. So my question to you is, I would like to see some discussions about the economic value of empathy as opposed to the fiscal reasoning, austerity discussions that we're getting maybe in the way that the Australian eco economist David Fro Throsby demonstrated the value-added chain of arts and creativity. So I'm wondering if you've got any comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Do, we, do we have some more comments and wrap up, or do you have a time? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, where are we? Just down here. Hi, I'm Bonnie. Um, just quickly touching on the subject of Iceland again. Um, wasn't particularly answered previously. Um, in regards to the alternatives to austerity and in the 2009 recession, um, the Icelandic people actually charged the banks, banksters and put the politicians in jail and whatnot. Do you think that um, if the rest of the world had actually followed this particular model, would we be in the same position that we are in today, globally? Okay, what we'll do now is we'll just wrap up with a few final comments from our panel um, in response to those questions and any sort of final comments that you might have. Well, I found, um, yeah, um, well, Iceland, I'm glad I was going to mention that, but I didn't have enough time. I, I think that Icelandic model is a, um, you know, what happened in Iceland um, was dramatic, it was, uh, uh, you know, across the, uh, the, the country, it was uh, intense and, um, you know, and the outcome was that um, uh, it was one of the, one, uh, the only country where um, the, the, the burden of the financial collapse wasn't uh, uh, unloaded on, onto Icelanders. And um, I think that has been, and the way that they went about that in terms of that um, collective, uh, well-organized, direct action, um, um, surrounding parliament and, and on a consistent basis. Um, and I, you know, I won't go into any more detail, but, but it's there to read in the, in the, 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 the third uh, briefing, sorry, the second briefing. And, uh, but I think that was very, very important and there are major lessons to learn from that. Yes, yeah, so trying to run backwards on Iceland. Well, on the general point of the financial sector, I think I mean uh, certainly the complete impunity of the financial sector was a disaster. But on the other hand, I think it's important not to think of this as individual wrongdoing. I mean, there was plenty of that, and a part of the part of the society that's emerged is one in which you know, the non-arrestable class was mentioned earlier. That essentially, if you're senior enough, you can get away with any wrongdoing, but. The people who were doing their jobs exactly as they were paid to, who weren't, uh, who weren't taking money from the till, who were playing by the rules, contributed collectively much more to the disaster than uh, the um, Bernie Madoffs and people like that um, who were actually actually doing stuff that was illegal. So the, so the problem, the primary problem, is is the system, of course, uh, you know, the the ease with which you know, various criminality, you know, various features of criminality. Uh, can be got away with is, is just part of that system and until the financial sector as a whole is cut drastically down to size I think uh, that's really the lesson that needs to be learned of course in some sense the Icelandic banks overreached so drastically that that part of it was done done for them that uh, by the time the crisis hit they were utterly bankrupt and couldn't possibly be uh, bailed out or, or rescued I think I wasn't quite I think I might have missed some key words in the question from the deputy mayor but uh, I think you know, one of the one of the points about you know, one of the points which I'm certainly grappling with about a future vision is I think that we need to you know, it's not it's important to uh, defend and recall the kind of values of post-war social democracy, Keynesianism, and so forth. But we are in a very different world, one where I think things like ideas and creativity matter more directly and uh, and more 
as an alternative to market processes than, than they did in the past. That, um, and that's, that's in terms of a positive vision, I guess that's something I'm, um, I'm grappling with a bit. Um, yeah, as regards uh, the uh, unions and the union inquiry, I mean, I think it would be an interesting question. We've seen in the past um, conservative governments set up these kind of inquiries. Uh, indeed, the bottom of the harbour scheme to which I, I referred uh, came out. I you know, was exposed, as I recall, by an attempt to uh, get stuck into the Melbourne Patent and Dockers Union, who uh, it turned out, among many other activities, were also uh, the ones who actually delivered the files to the bottom of the harbour. Uh, and so, so many senior people in the right of politics were ensnared by something which was originally supposed to be a straightforward piece of union bashing. So uh, I hope that the same emerges this time. <laughs> I will endorse that. Uh, I'll just make two quick points um, in that I echo what's been said here uh, on many issues. Um, um, with res respect to the uh, Tea Party and so on, I think this is, it, it does illustrate an Ill interesting moment in conservative politics. Um, I, I once interviewed some, um, uh, one, some of the key king think tank people who were around the Thatcher government in the 80s who described themselves as the motorcycle outriders of the political class, that they would take risks, say things that the politicians couldn't say and might not say for several years and be constantly pushing the envelope towards more and more ambitious uh, neoliberal or conservative strategies. I think that's the way that conservative think tanks used to work. Increasingly, it's the dynamic is for the Tea Party to express a kind of nihilistic um, politics which really has no uh, reasonable future uh, based on nativism and all manner of uh, confused positions. So now, uh, rather than the motorcycle outriders inspiring uh, the further movement of uh, conservative ideas, you've got Tea Party nihilism dragging it back and rendering the American Republican Party unelectable and, and so on. So that's a very different dynamic. Uh, and I, I think this is why I will kind of end on a, a, a less pessimistic note than I uh, normally dwell on. Um, this is where I think, where we can think about a different kind of language uh, for progressive uh, visions of the future. Uh, I think the fact that the, the right has entered this kind of nihilistic, repetitive mode um, does give an opportunity for other parts of the political spectrum to seize this moment. Um, uh, I, for one, am an advocate of the, um, the work of Carl Polanyi, who was, I think, a, a, a very interesting uh, figure for inspiring a different kind of politics for the 21st century. Um, what Polanyi talked about was the fact that all human societies uh, comprise a mixture of market exchange, reciprocity, um, and redistribution. They're features of all social systems, and, and they need to be brought into balance in different kinds of ways. I think that means we need to refine uh, languages around reciprocity and redistribution uh, to start to talk about those things in 21st century terms, uh, to embrace a positive agenda uh, which can seize uh, the initiative at a time when I think conservative politics are increasingly bankrupt. And it's on that uh, optimistic note that we have to close here today. Could you join me in thanking our three speakers? And can I once again thank uh, the Don Dunson Foundation for all its work in, in um, ensuring that this was a success today and my colleagues at the Australian Workplace Innovation and Social Research Centre. And thank you to all you for coming along today. I think it's testimony to the interest in austerity and the concern to look at alternatives to austerity that we've had so many people here today. Again, I'd urge you, um, if you're interested and committed, to further work in this area to support the work of the Don Dunstan Foundation uh, and the Unmasking Austerity Project. Our next task, obviously, is to unpack the Audit Commission report and then do some further work, work on alternatives, building on the work of Dexter, Field, Dexter Whitfield, Jamie Peck and John Quiggan, uh, among the greatest uh, intellectual leaders in this space. So thank you very much for coming along today. Our presentation will be available, um, all of today's proceedings will be available on the Don Dunstan website, as will be the PowerPoints that uh, our speakers have used today. So thanks very much for coming along. Look forward to seeing you 
at a Don Dunstan Foundation event in the near future. Thank you. Oh, and I should say, a small guest for our, sorry, a small present to our guests, uh, wherever it is, uh, just to cheer everyone up. Our, our, our choice of presents today are chocolates. What are you good people? <laughs> in a period of austerity, you give them chocolates, and lots of them. So, of course, from Hague's here in South Australia. Thank you. 